get, get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Zhang. I'm the Director of Marketing and BD at Cubic Center. It's my honor and great pleasure on behalf of Cubic Center to welcome all of you here join us today. Cubic Global Pitch Day is organized by Cubic Center for a global perspective on the life science industry. We host the event every quarter to share latest trends in the healthcare industry, connect the promising startups with our VC network, and encourage the effective exchange in ideas. The topic of today's event will be on immunology and immunotherapy. Cubic Center was founded in 2018. We aim to build up a global platform to connect innovation and entrepreneurship. Our business model offers different workspace, life space, technology cooperation, business services, and startup incubation. Our goal is to be an all-inclusive innovation center that affords our companies in our platform to have the opportunity to launch, scale, and sustain their startups on a local and global level. Hubei Silicon Valley site is the first physical site we built up in the US. In the meantime, we have begun the process of setting up innovation centers and cooperation agencies in several other countries, including Israel, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Mexico. In the near future, we will be long, long, launching our new site in Europe too. Today, we've invited six startups to share their ideas in immunology. We are also very honored to have Michael Shepard, who is a leading scientist in this area, to share his insights through his keynote speech. Today, we also have the participants from both offline and online. On Zoom, we have about 60 VCs who registered for this event. I listed some of our VIP partners here. Meanwhile, our event will be live streaming to around 300 to 500 people by our marketing partner, BioSeeding. We also have an offline event venue from our headquarter in Hangzhou. I hope everyone can enjoy the event today. We are also willing to make more connections for you after the event, if you want to learn more. Next, I'll pass the MC to my partner, Michael Zhao. Michael is based in Boston. He is our co-founder of Boston Center. He will moderate the following part for you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, for the introduction. Um, good night, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cuba uh, Global Pitch Day on um, immunotherapies. My name is Michael, and I'm one of the uh, partners of QB Center. I want to thank all of my colleagues for making this happen, uh, Dan, Yanlu, Tianyi, and Iko. Uh, without your help, none of this will happen. Um, today, we have our keynote speaker, Michael Shepard, a very uh, prestigious leader in biomarkers and immuno immunology field. He'll be talking about biomarkers in oncology. Uh, there will be six um, startup companies giving presentation later. Um, OK, let's get started. Uh, tonight, we are very honored to have uh, Michael uh, Shepard in house talking about biomarkers um, in uh, immunotherapy of cancer and auto, uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, Michael is a, a LASIKR Prize uh, laureate, inventor of Herceptin. Um, Herceptin is anti cancer antibody now used to treat more than 2.3 million breast cancer patients. Um, he is originally from um, Genetech team and created the translational biology department there. Um, he is also one of the developer of um, uh, Remicade, a TNF inhibitor. Also, uh, Michael founded um, Kenji Inc., the first uh, gene therapy company, and successfully initiated P53, targeting drug-resistant ovarian cancer. Um, he also founded um, New Biotech Inc. to focus on um, enzyme therapeutic agents. Um, recently, he co-founded Inozy Life Sciences with uh, Mark Feldman. Uh, focusing on treating cancer and uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, today, we're very honored to have Michael to give us a brief introduction about uh, biomarkers in uh, immunotherapy. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. That was fast. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I tried to <laughs> give you more time. Yeah, Mike. No, yeah, you can good. you can go ahead to stop my share screen to use your own. How do I do that? Uh, I can also stop here. Yeah, you can go ahead to share your slides. Oh, can you see my uh, slides down? And now yet? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, huh? what happened? Very sorry. I don't know what this is all about. Yeah, no problem. We, we saw your screen just now, but it stopped. Yeah. You can try again. Yeah. Can you see it now? Uh, no. Okay. And then I don't know what this is all about here. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hmm. I probably clicked my clicker too many times. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to present here. Um, the, the talk I will give tonight is a little bit different from uh, my usual um, kind of presentation. This is an overview, an educational overview of biomarkers in autoimmune disease and cancer and um, so there'll be an introductory part to familiarize people with biomarkers and the uh, language that surrounds uh, biomarkers. And uh, then uh, I'll talk about one of the most traditional biomarkers in cancer. And after that, we'll talk about some uh, other uh, issues. So let's start. <clears throat> the high level view of um, how we use biomarkers is shown in this slide. So um, if, if I fail to explain anything else in the whole talk, if you just remember this slide, then um, I will have succeeded in my talk. So um, biomarkers are, are used, they, they began to be used originally to uh, evaluate the risk of serious side effects for small molecule drugs. Things that are uh, liver toxic uh, would release enzymes from the liver. Things which are muscle toxic would release enzymes uh, from muscle. Uh, later, they were biomarkers were used to um, define patients that have a poor prognosis. And then later, high risk groups uh, for disease, and then uh, identifying patients that will respond to. Uh, a certain kind of therapy. And I'll, I'll be giving a few examples. So the terminology in biomarkers is sort of like this. Surrogate biomarkers are things that tell you um, basically how things are going in a therapy regimen. They can tell you if you have a, um, uh, a, uh, a progressing disease. So for instance, in diabetes, the marker is hemoglobin A1C, or just called A1C most of the time. If that's going up, your diabetes is getting worse. In cancer, a kind of surrogate marker, or uh, we call it surrogate endpoint sometimes for clinical trials is time to progression. So those are examples of surrogate biomarkers. 
And uh, then there are predictive biomarkers, uh, which are kind of the fancier ones that have been um, developed in, in the last 20 uh, or 30 years. Um, an example of one of those is HER2 overexpression predicts response to a HER2 targeted drug like trastuzumab or a new uh, antibody drug conjugate, which is approved now, which is called NHER2. In the next class, we're talking about prognostic biomarkers. We know that breast cancer patients that have mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 have a worse prognosis than the um, overall average of breast cancer patients. So having BRCA1 or 2 or both mutations is a prognostic marker. It tells the physician that um, he needs to take this person uh, very seriously. Similarly, HER2 overexpression is prognostic marker of patient survival uh, for those patients that overexpress HER2. There are now many examples in each one of these categories. An important thing to remember though is a biomarker can fit into more than one category. And a simple example of that is HER2 overexpression is a prognostic a biomarker to uh, predict a more aggressive disease. And it's also a predictive biomarker for response to HER2 targeted therapy. And um, there, there are many examples here, but this is just as part of an introduction to, um, to help people understand. Um, there are actually lots and lots of biomarkers. Um, that are used in medicine. Um, this is a partial list here. The traditional ones, an example is uh, CA-99, uh, are shed into the blood. And while most of the uh, biomarkers are proteins, some of them uh, might not be proteins. For example, CA-99 in pancreatic cancer is actually a polysaccharide. <clears throat> the structure of CA-199 I'm just showing here, not, not that you need to memorize it, but only uh, to show you that it's a polysaccharide. This biomarker is very well characterized, um, especially in pancreatic cancer, which is what I'll focus on today. But um, just to, a word of caution and uh, is that um, you can have pancreatic cancer without having any CA-199 uh, in your blood. So it is not a diagnostic. Uh, a normal level of CA-199 is 37 units per mil. Those are uh, arbitrary units, that, but they are standardized. If you have pancreatic cancer and your CA-99 is above 37 units per mil, um, that, that helps to confirm a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer or some other GI diseases. Now, I have this slide here. Uh, to, to show a couple of things. And I, I'm sorry if it's a little bit too complicated, but um, in patients, let, let's say that we're looking at a patient who um, has pancreatic cancer. And we begin um, to treat the pancreatic cancer with a drug like gemcitabine or abraxane. Those are two different ones. Let's say that the patient's CA-199 level goes way down following the treatment. 
patients that respond by decreased level of CA199 will have a longer survival. Patients that do not have a decrease in CA199 will have a shorter survival. What this means to a physician is um, patients that do not have a decrease in CA199 need, need to be on a more aggressive form of therapy. Sorry about the dog. Okay. Uh, the fact that um, patients that show a decrease in CA99 when they're being treated is very well known. And um, an important thing that we, we should uh, understand is that um, I'll, I'll give you my opinion here. Uh, my opinion is that a decrease in CA199 should be considered as a surrogate endpoint in the three in the in the testing of new drugs for pancreatic cancer. Now I, I don't make this recommendation lightly. The problem with pancreatic cancer is the median survival is very short. Almost nobody lives more than five years. Very few drugs have been approved to treat pancreatic cancer. If we decided we could um, use CA199 decrease, decrease as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials, we could get more drugs approved for pancreatic cancer and physicians could use those drugs to treat patients that do not otherwise respond to therapy. Drugs have a way of disappearing if they don't work. There, there are a number of safety valves that could be put on a system like this. But this is, uh, this is a, an issue that everybody shares. And uh, the United States regulatory and European regulatory agencies have been too slow to adopt a new way to measure endpoints in pancreatic cancer in order to get new drugs approved. I think that this is something everybody should think about as, um, as an opportunity uh, to make big progress on a terrible disease. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about breast cancer and um, the new era in breast cancer actually started in uh, the late seventies when this guy, uh, Elwood Jensen, who also received the Lasker award, um, discovered how the estrogen receptor worked, developed an assay for it, and then showed that um, patients who were positive for binding estrogen to tamoxifen, a drug that was already being tested, would uh, likely respond to that drug regimen. This is sort of the first example of molecular biology and biochemistry used to um, the estrogen receptor in breast cancer being, being used to um, enable the better treatment of cancer patients. Um, more recently, um, around, around that, uh, the, uh, the year 2000, <clears throat> a drug called trastuzumab uh, was approved, and that drug targets specifically the HER2 receptor. The, uh, the biomarker overexpression of the HER2 receptor is, as we talked about a minute ago, both uh, prognostic for patients and predictive for response to um, 
therapy with HER2 targeted treatments. On the left of this slide, I'm showing you the survival, average survival of breast cancer patient with uh, an overexpression of HER2 as compared to all breast cancer patients, the top, top line. So uh, you can see how, how it's uh, predictive or how, how it's prognostic for these patients. On the other hand, the same biomarker, HER2 overexpression, is not um, useful as a biomarker in another type or subtype of breast cancer called ductal carcinoma in situ, sometimes called DCIS. Um, in DCIS, which nobody is quite sure how to characterize, you can have either high HER2 or low HER2. If anything, higher levels of HER2 actually predict a better outcome in, that, in this disease. So you should not think that a, a biomarker which is useful in one disease is also gonna be useful in another disease. Now this slide quickly just shows that um, the progression of biomarker discovery from a very laborious biochemical research and not much impact to the current time, which is really based for the most part on next generation sequencing. And that's what I'll talk about for a couple of minutes. So uh, the future of biomarkers is really the exploration of uh, of, of things of the disease using unbiased technologies, taking advantage of very high throughput marker, very high throughput methods, and um, and my my favorite is proteomics. It's not next generation sequencing, and we could all talk about that later. But it's proteomics uh, for me. So uh, I spend most of my time when I'm thinking about this kind of thing, uh, thinking about how to uh, enhance proteomics discovery in biomarkers. Um, there's a, a wonderful uh, young researcher at Beijing University called Catherine Wang. She's developed a high throughput mass spec method they can even measure 2,500 proteins in a single cell. So the input into this machine is a single cell and she can see 2,500 different proteins. This is a lot different than the biomarker that I developed for treating patients with, um, with Herceptin. In that biomarker, we had a chunk of tumor and we stained it. And uh, we would look at sort of the average staining across the slide. Using Catherine's, uh, Dr. Wong's approach, we can pluck tumor cells out of the slide. We can analyze the proteins that are in just the tumor cells, not all the cells in the tumor, but just in the tumor cells. That will give us a much more reliable idea of what the proteins are that are important and also help identify new targets in treating the disease. So uh, uh, I guess I left this animation in, sorry. Um, an important, uh, important thing to know for everybody is that uh, because of the Human Genome Project, and the uh, development of proteomics technologies, we can now detect 90% of all proteins uh, in the, that humans make. We, we can have a spot on a mass spec and we can figure out the sequence of the protein from that spot and we know what it is. And uh, I've put two examples here of, of things uh, done by Catherine Wong and also by Leroy Hood. Um, 
So for instance, Dr. Wang using her technology showed that in early infections of COVID-19, the, the virus is actually immunosuppressive. Uh, Dr. Hood, on the other hand, has been able to describe a whole variety of organ-specific proteins uh, in, in different organs of, of a mouse. Now, this might sound a little bit like basic research, and it's good to know that kind of thing, uh, sort of uh, whatever reason. Uh, but I want to point out the, uh, the importance. So for instance, ovarian, metastatic ovarian cancer is not curable by any mechanism. But the cells, the tumor cells of metastatic ovarian cancer are still related to the original ovarian uh, tissue. So we could target proteins that are organ specific for the ovary and kill any cells in the body that have ovarian proteins on them specific for the ovary. That's a completely different way to think about how to kill the tumor. So being able to find these proteins is actually very important in terms of thinking about developing therapies. Another example um, that, that's important is uh, the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors that we uh, that have been really a breakthrough. They're only effective in 20 to 30% of patients, but all patients suffer the same side effects from uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. I believe it's likely that we could tell the difference between patients who would respond and patients that do not respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors if we look closely enough. We would um, free up resources that could be spent focused on patients that will respond and we will, free up, and we will free up resources that can be used for other things as well. The biggest drugs on the planet Earth are the TNF blockers, almost $50 billion a year. Uh, just for drug costs. In this disease, in, these, in autoimmune disease, uh, it's also the case that um, TNF blockers will only work in less than half, but let's say half of all um, patients that, that where we try them. So you can imagine the numbers here. Uh, we're actually, we're we're spending $40 billion a year on these drugs, but 20 billion of it is not, is not successful. And there actually are publications that help tell the difference between these uh, patient groups already. So the idea of being able to tell the difference between them is not pie in the sky, but somebody needs to grab this opportunity and, and help everybody else benefit from it. Now, when I say 20 billion in drug costs, um, remember these patients that are being treated with TNF blockers have the same dangerous side effects as everybody else. So um, it, it's at least $8 billion in medical costs for those patients that for, for things that they wouldn't be suffering from if they hadn't been treated with a TNF blocker. That's a lot of money. Um, it also means because these drugs are so expensive, it means that not very many people can actually get them, even if they would respond. So if we can decrease the cost of these drugs by, by determining which patients are going to respond and just treating those patients, 
the health system in every country around the world that uses these drugs uh, would be saving a huge amount of money, and that money could be used for some other purpose. So um, just to finish up, uh, I'd like to uh, mention that and point out that um, the life sciences have generated tons and tons of new drugs in the last 20 years, more drugs in the last 20 years than in the previous 100 years. Uh, but overall health has not been terribly uh, impacted by these drugs, although individuals have certainly, um, certainly benefited. And one path to doing better is to invent new drugs that are much more specific for the targets that we that we that we know are important. Um, and interesting, uh, just to show that this is possible, for more than twenty years, the only drug for HER2 positive breast cancer was trastuzumab, and a little bit the ADC called Cadsila. But now Daiichi Sankyo and AstraZeneca have a new drug, which is still HER2, it's the same antibody, still trastuzumab, it's the same antibody, but it has a different kind of a warhead attached to it than had ever been tried before. And um, in patients that have failed every kind of HER2 directed therapy, this drug really works well. 60% of patients benefit from it. We should try to do the same thing for patients who uh, are being treated with TNF blockers. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, I hope I didn't go too much uh, over time, Michael. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, really nice presentation. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Um, are there any questions that you guys um, can raise your hand? Um, if you are in Hangzhou or um, raise your hand, I mean, press the raise hand button if you are using Zoom. Um, I'm happy to um, read the questions for you. Thank I'll you. be back in a second. Somebody is in trouble. I apologize. No worries, no worries. <laughs> okay, I can start. I can start with one question, um, if you uh -huh. don't mind. So yeah. because there are a lot of the, the different biomarkers, um, as you mentioned, um, but because we also know some other categories like the molecular biomarkers and uh, the cellular biomarkers or imaging biomarkers, is there any way mm -hmm. that we, we can integrate all those information in different platforms, um, try to put more information together and then to generate a whole um, to have more information? Is it possible? Yeah, I, of course it is. Um... The um, somebody just has to do it. Uh, it, it. A lot of the molecular biomarkers have been assembled uh, very efficiently by uh, the by the Broad Institute at MIT. Uh, but um, when you're when you're talking about uh, imaging biomarkers, I, I'm not sure that there's any any database like that. There there probably is, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, we, we, we surely have a lot of data, like the imaging data um, in the hospital in the EPIC system, but just nobody is really digging into this data set. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I think I missed a slide in, in this. Um, there was a, a point I wanted to make, um, and that is that it seems to me that... Um, that uh, China 
with, with cities like Shanghai and Hangzhou with um, large number of people there and with very large uh, and centralized healthcare systems yeah, of course. Have a gi- have a gigantic opportunity to uh, really lead the way for uh, biomarker driven drug discovery and clinical trials, and and I hope that um, that that happens. Yeah, of course, of course, but it's it's going to probably use uh, artificial intelligence to do that. I mean, the data set is enormous, as you said, giant data set, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just big. Well, the, the thing to do is figure out how to do it, uh, n- not to assume it can't be done because it's too big. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's because this can be done, it's because it's too big. If it's not big enough, <laughs> nobody will do that, right? That's paradox. That's true too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks. That's a good comment. Well, another another way to look at it is somebody figures out how to do it, they'll get really rich and famous. <laughs> I'm sure about it. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Feel free to ask if you have anyone um, have any questions. That's fine. Don't worry. Um, I can start with another one, actually. Um, so I was thinking about like the um, a lot of people are doing the biomarkers with the diagnostics, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people using that for um, for the for the um, drug efficacy as well. But um, like the physiological condition compared with the patient in, in like in disease, are there any um, changes like for inflammation? For example, under inflammation, um, the biomarker all working or sometimes, for example, in breast cancer, if the patient still have the inflammation and without inflammation, does the biomarker change or at, change at all? You, I mean, my question is like the biomarker, do you have to consider a patient's condition, health condition for the biomarkers or um, most of the time you don't. Um, so it's like, yeah, if, you're in a different, in, if you're in different days, like in summertime, wintertime, and you're different, age, different, different ages, different period of your lifetime. Um, so do we have to consider all of this information to give a informative conclusion for the biomarkers or no? Uh, not for the biomarker, uh... Uh, but but um, but with different ages and sexes and things like that, um, it's good to have that kind of information. Um, in in some environments, um, uh, really old guys who uh, uh, have prostate cancer aren't treated uh, because. Um, you know, it's not financially uh, reasonable to do so. I, I'm not talking about myself, so don't worry <laughs> about that. Um, but but I, I think you asked a question about um, inflammatory disease. Yeah. In, in autoimmune diseases, there are a number of biomarkers uh, like C-reactive protein and other things like that, those things get reduced when a patient is responding to a TNF blocker. Uh, They don't get reduced if the patient is not responding. That's already known. And that should be incorporated into uh, the first, into a decision whether or not to continue (coughs) therapy on these drugs. Sure. Um, thanks, Michael, for your for time. It's really a wonderful presentation. Um, really glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any more questions, um, um, you can always drop me an email and I can uh, connect you with Michael afterwards. So feel free to contact us anytime uh, during the no, meeting. Happy thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having you tonight. Thank you.
Thank you. Sorry about the dark. <laughs> Later. No worries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so later we'll have the uh, startup company giving the, pre uh, the presentations. Um, the first one um, will be Arden Pharma. Um, a brief introduction about Arden Pharma. Um, it's a uh, biotech company to discover uh, and develop novel uh, drugs in oncology. The scientific team has over 10 years of experience of immune system modulation, leading to the creation of the portfolio for potential new oncology drugs. Uh, today, Maria uh, Varela is going to talk about it. Uh, Maria, are you online? Yes, perfect. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, so I'll... You see my screen now? Okay, great. So... First off, I want to thank for the opportunity to present our company. As you all introduced, we are a startup developing normal immunotherapies for cancer patients. And specifically, what we are presenting is a novel way to modulate uh, inflammation in cancer. So we are pursuing this by uh, presenting a uh, toroid inflammation axis that is involved in anti-tumor responses and targets also the malignant cell. So our science and our technology has enabled us to file uh, to now three patents and we are working on the fourth one. We have managed to accomplish a strong in vivo and in vitro proof of concept with a small molecule. It's a compound that we named boritinib while describing novel mechanisms of actions. And finally, and uh, you know, carrying on with what Michael just presented about the importance of biomarkers, we are also working on a gene molecular signature in order to um, establish association and correlation with immunotherapy clinical outcomes that may accelerate our translational studies. So you are well aware about the breakthroughs of target and immunotherapies the last decade. However, and as Michael said, 20% of patients, I mean, depends on the indication, but however, both treatments they're still dealing with the problem of resistance, either the novel or acquired after the treatment. So our format is trying to help this scenario, help to change it. And we are doing that by presenting Torrid as a novel factor uh, of resistance to this treatment. So Torrid is a protein that works as a novel checkpoint of the innate immune system, specifically is a negative regulator of the most well-known inflammasome, the NLRP3. So we have described how Torrid is uh, immunosuppressing uh, the, the, the profile of the innate uh, immunity responses. So a few, in, in fact, Torrid is the short name for transmembrane protein 176 AMB. Few scientific groups have reported a negative correlation between Torrid overexpression and bad clinical outcome across different types of tumors, such as glioblastoma, gastric cancer, our scientific group also contributed with the studies in different types of tumor. We are seeing here transcriptomic analysis on primary human cells of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, similar results also obtained with colon cancer patients. Again, the interesting thing here is that we managed to establish how Torrid is also overexpressed among metastatic melanoma patients which were unresponsive to immunotherapy treatment with checkpoint blockers, specifically anti pd one so the key thing here is that this overexpression of Torrid was seen during treatment, but not before. Again, supporting the notion of Torrid being a resistance factor. Therefore, we developed Torrid inhibitors. Boritinib is a small molecule that by blocking Torrid, it is unleashing inflammatory pathways, re reinforce anti-tumular responses, and at the same time, is targeting the malignant cell. So when we administer boritinib in vivo mice models of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we are able to increase the survival. And also we are promoting uh, the, the leukocyte uh, death. Similarly, in mice models of T-cell lymphoma, again, the administration of boritinib is enhancing, it's promoting uh, better survival. And when we generate the knockout mice for, the, for Torrid, we lose this effect, proving the on-target efficacy of boritinib on Torrid. And uh, most nice thing is what happens when we combine boritinib with today's most used anti uh, checkpoint blockers, which are anti-PD-1. 
Well, we, here I can show you, you see the blue curves. I am showing how by combining these two treatments, we are able to increase the overall survival in tum tumors such as colon, lung cancer, melanoma, and T cell lymphoma. And we are studying the rationale behind this, the mechanisms of action behind this. And we were able to describe how the inflammatory profile is able to impact on the exhaustion stage of TCD8 cells. Therefore, it is important to bear in mind the combination that by giving antipd one and then coming up with an inflammasome modulating therapy, we are giving time to express or to augment the expression of Gransin B and diminishing the exhaustion of uh, transitory exhausted T cells and therefore making it them able to control the tumor. So basically what our technology is trying to show is that by blocking boritinib, we are unleashing two parallel mechanisms. The first one, it is aiming to uh, gener uh, generate this immune modulation. And this is an investigation that's currently going though we started a couple of years ago. Uh, now it's currently granted by, the, by a, a grant from the NIH and in order to to specifically um, characterize some, you know, some characteristics of this mechanism of action that we are the first ones to describing. And by the way, another thing that happens while we are blocking Torrid is that we promote an inflammasome dependent death uh, to the malignant cell deaths, as we show with the leukocyte cords of chronic CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So having said, and having presented a, bit, a little bit of technology, I would like now to you know, highlight some features about our company. Specifically, we have a holding corporation, I mean, in Delaware, with two subsidiaries, uh, operative companies uh, down in South America, in Uruguay and in Argentina. And why is this? It's because Ardan Pharma is a spin-off from academic institutions in Uruguay, specifically the University of the Republic, and the Institute Pasteur of Montevideo. Our initial investor is called CITES. It is the first high-tech uh, venture builder company of our region, which gave, granted us our seed capital of a little bit more of uh, 500K in order to start our business. By the way, our research is still being carried out in these laboratories at the Institute Pasteur of Montevideo, which were labeled as centers of excellence by FOSIS, by the Federation of Clinical Immunology Society. And these uh, have enabled us to get on a, a network of key opinion leaders and uh, establish that. But specifically, and to the purpose of Arden, uh, the science on our investigation enable us to file uh, uh, some patents at, regarding our technology. The first one is uh, patent protecting the use of boritinib in combination with tech blockers. It's a patent that it has been already granted. The second one uh, takes a, lot, a little bit similarly combining with um, checkpoint blockers, but it's also uh, considering some specific issues upon the inflammasome activation and gathers uh, uh, another portfolio of compounds. The third one is aiming to improve you know, uh, the efficacy of boritinib itself. And the fourth one is what I, we are working right now. We are generating a novel composition of matter generating derivatives for Boris Neve. I mean, as a discovery company, we are still at the uh, lead optimization process of Boris Neve in order to um, know very well the, the typical properties that are needed in order to finalize uh, uh, the compound to take into the clinics. You know, the further steps are commonly uh, known for each uh, preclinical investigation. And we are estimating uh, uh, the, the standard 18 months in order to be able to uh, take our candidate into an IND submission and enable a clinical trial. For that purpose, of course, we are fundraising private uh, investment in order to get a first in human clinical trial for this uh, new mechanism that we are proposing. Uh, this is all estimated. Of course, we are early, we know that, but we have uh, some bullets in order to have a first in human trial for metastatic melanoma patients, especially those who didn't respond to antibody one uh, checkpoint blockers. And we are thinking about 30, 30 patients initially in eight sites of Germany in order to, to carry on. But of course, this is uh, a little bit early to decide and we are open to discuss other alternatives. So just to um, give an input or an insight about the, the market that it's behind the oncology, it is estimated in more than 270 billions in the five years. 
that it's um, in 2025. But if you think a little bit about what happened with inflammasome deals uh, uh, a few years ago, you can see big players that have had a huge bet on targeting the NRRP3 inflammasome. So it, I think there is quite an appetite there. But uh, if I would have to choose, you know, some similar competitors to our company, I would present these two companies that are startups also that are targeting a negative regulator of Sting. Uh, so it is kind of analog uh, way uh, to the purpose of our startup. Uh, however, they are competitors between them. I want to find someone that is starting in Torrid and I got it. I can do it. Anyway, your attention to the deals that they have been uh, able to make, you know, with very preclinical, uh, uh, early preclinical investigation, they were um, managing to, to have nice runs of investments. So I hope that this is our case too in the following months. So just to finish, I would like to present my co-founders, both Dr. Marcelo Gil and Paolo Peso are immunologists and principal investigators at different laboratories from the Institute Pasteur of Montevideo. As uh, Michael introduced us, they have a uh, track record years on in investigating immunology and uh, you know, biologic mechanisms as associated to cancer progression. Me, myself, at last, I'm kind of from the scientific side, but I jumped into the business side two years ago. So I, I am a chemist and I met them during my postgrade in biotechnology. But Ardan is not there, nothing more lovely that having people wanting to work with you. And in that case, we managed to sum up to a team, uh, experienced people in the life science business, in, especially with William Mann, in the venture side with uh, Gerardo Marchesini and Nicolas Tognali that have been uh, more than seven, 10 years working with uh, startups and taking them to the next level. Uh, more on the development side, we count very much on Silvina Garcia Rubio. She has, uh, you know, she's VP at, at the CMC part of Clinic Pharmaceuticals. Maybe you have heard about him because it's in San Diego. And just to finish, uh, also we can't, I know we are early, but we uh, want to think um, from the very, very beginning into the designs of the next clinical trial that we are going to make. So Mercedes Lassus Brin, she's an oncologist and she has more than 20 years on consulting for pharmaceutical or academic groups in the clinical investigation. So I think I'm done here. I don't know how it's the time, Michael, I'm sorry. I think I managed to have it in 15 minutes. And if not, my apologies. Here is my contact uh, information if you want to dig in further and that's it. Thanks, Maria, for your presentation. Yeah, welcome. Thanks to you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And uh, um, certainly there is a huge potential. Are there any questions um, for, um, for Arden, for Maria? Uh, please uh, raise your hand or um, uh, unspeak yourself if you want. Thank you. Oh, there's someone um, in the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Uh, Xiao Zhou. Xiao Zhou, in the audience, please go ahead. I see you're uh, raising your hand. You can just uh, mute yourself and speak directly. Maybe he did. He didn't mean it. <laughs> and also, Michael is raising here. Michael, you, you got a question, or if if you have a question, please go ahead. Okay. I mean, while we're waiting. Um... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. I was uh, muted. Um, I I got it fixed. I think Mr. or Dr. Zhao is also muted. Uh, anyway, um, I, I, I enjoyed that uh, presentation very much. Thank you. And, and then uh, how exactly does the drug work? <clears throat> Do you uh, think? By, yeah, by inhibiting taurid. 
you know, sorry, it's, a, it's a transmembrane. Yeah, I get. I mean, it's uh, the it's a molecular. It's a small molecule that mm -hmm. um, maybe what I should have mentioned is that taurid is expressed in transmembrane from endosomes. So when the drug is uh, in interiorized in the cell, uh, it it is it is able to inhibit taurid in that way. Uh, that alters ionic mechanisms that are able to activate NLRP3. Do you, do you follow up? It's, it's because uh, ionic uh, cutting channels efflux, it's, it's alterated by, and it's controlled in some oh, way. I by okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Now, no, I, I saw the ionic channel, but I wasn't and you know, sure. Yeah, okay. I got it. You know, Michael, some of other investors that I've been talking to have asked me why Tori couldn't be a biomarker. And we said that, yes, that we are working on that. <laughs> but I think that yeah. the therapeutic approach is also very interesting. So we are trying to handle the both uh, sides. Yeah, yeah it's actually. It could go together. Yeah, exactly. That's what we are trying to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's actually a very interesting follow-up question to Michael's question. Um, so uh, because it's been inhibiting TARD, if I'm understanding correctly, but have you done any biochemistry work to see what is um, um, like ITC or uh, mass spec to see um, the efficiency um, inhibiting TARD? Is there any numbers? You know, the, the efficacy, yeah, we have managed to develop like two in vitro assays uh, by over expressing TORID and treating them with different concentrations and mm -hmm. establish a dose response efficacy, but that's not the whole point. I mean, yes, it is important and it's kind of the basis, but it doesn't make sense if, we, if that doesn't take to activate an LRP3 inflammasome. So we have developed another say in order to, uh, you know, measure uh, IL-1 beta, caspes one you know, different scopes that, that may take us to, you know, continue developing the efficacy of inhibiting TORI. Okay. But there is uh, no any purified tori has been um, like proved in vitro, right? Uh, you you mean like for example um, purified tori? X-ray, yeah, but uh, yeah, but X-ray is difficult because it's a transmembrane protein. Yeah, we have discussed that a lot, and we have managed to test efficacy by other size because there's no X-ray. Yeah, that's a, okay. that's a, a good point. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Um, Shelju, I think you're, um, I'll probably ask you to unmute. Okay, um, so if no, any other questions? Is there any other questions? If, if there's no more questions, I'll probably, um, um, yeah, thank, thank Maria for coming here today. Um, if you have more questions, you're um, always welcome to drop us emails or um, leave that in the chat box. Um, we'll connect you guys later for sure. Um, thanks, Maria. It's a really wonderful presentation and really glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Okay, um, so the next company is actually, um, I think the slide is slightly, uh, can, can you go back to a um, couple of slides? Because there are some changes. Um, next one will be um, immune. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Um, nectin. Nectin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the reason we put we, we, we put nectin ahead is because they are um, there, 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 there are some changes. So the um, uh, reason you'll be presenting later. So um, the nectin, uh, uh, nectin therapeutics, it's uh, um, just brief introduction. It's developing novel uh, normal uh, clonal antibody directed towards members of nectin families, receptors and ligands that have major roles in immune checkpoints for cancer therapies. Um, this novel um, antibodies are developed for um, the treatment of solid and blood tumors. Um, today, Fabian um, uh, 10 m bomb is going to talk about it. Uh, Fabian, you here? Um, hang on. Hello, Fabian, you here?
Oh, maybe later. Um, yeah, because he said he got a conflict later, so I'll just put him as um, ahead. But um, in that case, um, I'll probably I'll probably go with the repair uh, for now. Um, so for um, uh, repair uh, about, te about technologies, as a developer of uh, clinical gene and protein therapy uh, therapies, attend, uh, intended to focus on immune uh, function. The company's platform is committed to developing uh, treatments for aging and aging or age related diseases that address the root causes for these conditions, enabling uh, human beings to improve the health span through the targeting the cause of age related disease and aging cells. Um, today, we have the founder and CEO Reason. Um, Reason is going to let us know the reason that why Repair is a very promising company. Reason, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, take over the screen here, if you don't mind. Sure. So let's uh, talk about us. Um, in the matter of aging itself, um, though I should say we're more a cardiovascular company, if you care to look at us that way, uh, you should always look at a company that's working on aging and ask, are they repairing something? Are they fixing something? Have they found a form of damage and they're reversing it? If you can't figure out that that is what they're doing, then it's possible that they're not doing something useful. That's why we're called Repair Biotechnologies. So what we do um, primarily at the head of our program is we produce macrophages that can degrade cholesterol. And we use those to reverse atherosclerosis, um, which is a holy grail of the community. So primarily, this is an outgrowth of what we call the cholesterol degrading platform um, in the grand tradition of calling things what they do. So CDP. Um, CDP is a collection of genes which you can introduce into any mammalian cell uh, that allows that cell to then break down excess cholesterol without any sort of negative consequences at all. It's very safe. Uh, we target macrophages initially because they're relevant to atherosclerosis. Um, but in principle, you could put this into any cell. And the, the chart here shows us producing exactly the same result in terms of breaking cholesterol down into its catabolite in workhorse 293T kidney cells versus uh, U93, um, U937 macrophages. It works exactly the same way in any cell. So why atherosclerosis? Um, because it's the one of the highest goals, arguably the highest goal in medicine. Atherosclerotic plaque is directly responsible for killing 27% of everybody. One quarter of the audience in this chat is going to die from this disease unless we do something. And uh, the reason you die is because you get plaque that grows in your arteries. Plaque is roughly a lump of cholesterol and dead cells. Uh, and it causes a heart attack or a stroke and you die. Um, and the present standard of care is utterly inadequate to dealing with this condition. Statins and similar technologies focused on lowering LDL cholesterol cannot do more than slightly slow this down. So our approach is to take the fact that monocytes and macrophages are the cells that normally keep your arteries clear in youth and we manufacture these cells from iPSCs and make them resilient to the plaque environment by allowing them to break down cholesterol using CDP. Um, so therefore the result is resilient macrophages that can be delivered as a cell therapy. So progress to date, we've raised about 8 million since 2018. We've produced proof of concept data using gene therapies Delivered, delivering CDP systemically into mice, uh, very high dose gene therapies that are very safe. In fact, they're safer than statins. Um, and they something like halve the atherosclerotic plaque lipids in a single month with a single treatment. This is a very large, very significant effect, particularly since we achieve it very safely. Uh, statins can reduce plaque by maybe a few percentage points. Once plaque is established, it will continue to grow until it kills someone. And that's fundamentally why this condition kills so many people. There is no way to reverse it effectively in modern medicine. So we have established production of iPSC-derived CDP-expressing 
M2 phenotype monocytes. And for those who know macrophages and monocytes, M2 is the, is the regenerative phenotype, whereas M1 is the aggressive um, cell killing phenotype. M1 is good for cancer. Uh, and it's actually much harder to produce M2 macrophages. So we like to tap the fact that we can do that. So we're producing efficacy data. We're in the middle of that process. When we have it, we make a pharma partnership and we plan to start clinical trials in um, the orphan condition for accelerated atherosclerosis by let's say the end of 2023. We're currently raising a, uh, finishing off a $5 million safe note. We have $1.5 million left to fill on that 50 million post money cap. And we we're going to roll into a large A round sometime later this year, um, assuming everything goes well. So to return to this whole business of, of cholesterol, and macrophages and people dying. Um, fundamentally, this is the root of atherosclerosis. Ignore what everybody says about blood cholesterol. That, that's not really the important problem here. The important problem is that you have a lump of cholesterol in your blood vessel wall. As soon as that starts to happen, then you know, you're doomed at this point. That, that lump of cholesterol will just continue to grow because it attracts macrophages um, they die, and in dying, they create an inflammatory environment that attracts more macrophages. It's a feedback loop. Um, and we seek to break that loop by interfering at the point of, of the macrophage. Now, historically, and I'm not going to say this was a bad idea because it was a really good idea at the time, um, people, the entire industry has focused on lowering LDL cholesterol in the bloodstream. This is one input to the problem of, of growing plaques, but it's not the majority input once you have an established plaque. So the problem here with all of these drugs um, is that all you can do is slow down the condition. You can't reverse it to a meaningful degree. And nonetheless, um, the whole industry has, has sort of, you know, been developed on this principle. Um, there are surrogate biomarkers, the LDL cholesterol in bloodstream, it's very easy to measure. And so what we get these days is an infinite progression of new LDL lowering drugs, uh, the latest of which I think from Regeneron was approved at, at $450,000 a year for a patient, which is crazy. Um, these drugs will not do any better than statins in reducing mortality. And that is because your mortality is determined by your plaque burden. It is not determined by blood cholesterol. The, the only thing you can do to rapidly and dramatically reduce mortality would be to get rid of the plaques, uh, which is what we aim to do by providing competent macrophages to the patient. And this is very linear. If you have twice as many plaques, you have twice the mortality, roughly. Um, so to summarize that, this is a really huge market. It's an enormous market but it's an enormous market that only produces marginal therapies. So we can look at Lipitor. That's one statin out of many statins, 150 billion a year in sales. But these drugs only slow the progression of the, of the, of the condition. 27% of humanity dies in the world in which everybody who can take statins does take statins. Whereas as I, the drug I mentioned that's coming out from Regeneron was, is $450,000 a year which, um, and frankly, it's, it's really not gonna be much better than statins. The only difference will be the side effect profile and, and who benefits from it. So if you want to look at a comparable in this industry, this very hot industry, Verve Therapeutics um, is developing something that is objectively worse than our technology. It's really just another statin. They went public with no human data at all, nothing, only mice and primate data and their valuation, $1.5 billion. Now think about what this market is gonna look like when somebody turns up with a drug um, or a treatment that can actually meaningfully reverse plaque. And that's the future we see for ourselves. Because what we're going to do, we're gonna take the macrophages, we're gonna put our CDP in them, and then give them to the patient in order to get rid of these lumps of cholesterol in their arteries. Um, and this is the solution, the real solution to the problem. In vitro, we can demonstrate why. So let's take these raw 264 macrophages. It's a mouse line. Um, they're, very, they're workhorse cells. People use them very widely. They're very well understood. 
what we're doing here is we're taking some naive raw 264s that are unmodified on the left and some raw 264s that express our CDP genes on the right. Now, in both cases, they've been given a fluorescently labeled cholesterol enough to make the cells normal macrophages very unhappy. These macrophages on the left are dying. They've become foam cells and they're called foam cells because you can see these foamy bubbles of um, cholesterol inside them. These cells are inflammatory, they're dying, some of them are dead. On the right, the same dose of cholesterol is just consumed by our CDP macrophages. If this was inside your arteries, these cells would be fine, they'd be doing their job, they'd be getting on with reversing the plaque. And that's exactly what we want to achieve. Now, it's important for those who understand macrophages that, that when we produce monocytes slash macrophages um, in our lab, we're producing M2 type macrophages. And we can prove that we have the markers that show that they are in fact M2 type. Uh, and this is really important because um, macrophages do not like to be altered. It's rather challenging to produce M2 macrophages that are engineered. Um, and the world really wants a supply of M2 macrophages for all sorts of things, not just what we would like to use them for here. So it's, it's not a small thing that we can produce M2 macrophages to order. There are companies out there who basically do nothing but this, that, that's their job. Um, that's their whole modus operandi. We want to use them for something. That something being reversal of atherosclerosis. Now I've mentioned earlier that we actually conducted a gene therapy proof of concept where we deliver CDP at quite high dose, um, 10 to the 12 viral particles into mice. And what you're looking at on the left here are cross sections of the aortic root. For those who are unfamiliar with this, the little fiddly bits in the middle, those are valves and the red is staining for lipids. So you can see to the naked eye that the treated mice on the right are far better off than the untreated mice. Their, the lipid content in their, in their aortic root has been dramatically reduced by about 50%, in fact. This is a very large effect um, in, the, in the context of, of atherosclerosis mouse models. Very hard to do. And the fact that these mice showed no side effects whatsoever, their blood chemistry is exactly the same. They're, there's no weight loss, no signs of problems. If you high dose statin, give high dose statins to mice, you see all sorts of problems. Our treatment is much safer than high dose statins and enormously more effective. Now, the reason we go with induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, as a basis for our macrophages is, is several fold. I mean, firstly, we want a very robust manufacturing process. We don't want a cell therapy which involves taking cells from the patient because A, that is very expensive. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with CAR T therapies. And B, um, you really can't edit macrophages uh, without turning them into M1 phenotype angry cells, which is really good if you want to treat cancer, for example. And people do this, um, but it's really not very helpful if you want regenerative um, activities. So you're kind of um, stuck with this, this much better approach, a little bit more complicated. And there are a number of companies out there that uh, work on universal cells, of course. We are partnered with um, one of them. And uh, we work with their human lines in addition to the mouse lines that we have established in order to create proof of concept studies. But at the end of the day, one would hope you would have a very cheap off-the-shelf treatment that is in the sort of $10,000 um, per, per patient um, order of magnitude, rather than being something like half a million dollars, like, um, like a CAR-T therapy. Nonetheless, um, you cannot treat everybody in the world at $10,000 per patient. And certainly cell therapies require somewhat more work uh, in order to scale than small molecule therapies. That's just a reality. So, but a good thing about um, atherosclerosis, one of the few good things, is that it does have orphan condition variants. There are genetic conditions in which you have high blood cholesterol throughout your life. And as a result, you have a much shorter life expectancy. Um, this is particularly terrible for the heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia folk because they are rarely diagnosed before they have a heart attack. 
uh, and suddenly you have a heart attack in your late 40s and your doctor tells you that you have 10 years left to live and there's nothing you can really do about that because no treatment can reverse the very established atherosclerotic plaque that you have. So we can start at a small market and a small manufacturing base and scale up to what will eventually be an entire industry focused on the, the patients, the 10 to 20 million patients worldwide who have the worst atherosclerosis, the people who will die within a few years unless somebody, somebody can reverse their lesions because no established treatment at the moment can do that. So we own this. Um, we have an exclusive license under very favorable terms. You will never ever in your life see this again, no cash milestones. Um, we were the first people to put this into mice. We actually licensed this prior to anybody really knowing whether it was safe at all. And fortunately for everybody concerned, it is a tremendously safe therapy. So we really own this field. We, we control the patentry um, and we will go forward on that basis. So us, a little bit about myself and my co-founder are quite well known in the longevity aging space. Um, we've been investors, we've been patient advocates. Uh, we know a lot of the players and movers out there. And once it got to the point where we started our own company because some things weren't moving fast enough. So here we are. Morad, our CSO, has a, a principal investigator background in cardiometabolic medicine at Pfizer and Harvard Medical School. He's actually a friend of the inventor of CDP, which is how we met him. And uh, he has a strong familiarity with uh, what we're trying to do here. Bobby Kahn is a physician specializing in atherosclerosis. He, he um, has put drugs through the FDA and keeps us on the straight and narrow with regard to our impending approach to the FDA after we have our, um, our, our pharma partnerships done and uh, our cells showing efficacy. And we have a sterling uh, advisory board. Richard Hong Cannon is the inventor of this technology. His team did a lot of work on the very hard uh, mechanisms of ensuring that a cell can actually break down cholesterol safely. Um, Graham is a fellow traveler from the, uh, the longevity industry. And of course, if you're working with macrophages and monocytes, you need an immunologist to help, uh, help wrangle these cells. They're, they're not the easiest um, to get to do what you want them to do. And of course, uh, Andrew and Babak are specialists in their areas. Um, and I won't say much about the liver side of things other than uh, too much cholesterol in the liver is actually a bad thing. And it's something that we can probably address as uh, with our form of therapy. So as I mentioned, we're going to aiming to raise 20 million or so later this year, once we're um, in position, and that would take us through to, uh, to clinical trials, hopefully starting at the end of 2023 or thereabouts. And I think that's, um, that's quite enough of that. We can, we can pull a halt there and I'm happy to take questions on, on that note. Hi, thanks for this wonderful presentation. Um, so if there are any questions from the audience, uh, feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Pretty sure Michael has his hand raised there. If that wasn't left over from the last one, it's great. It's great. Um, the time, time is perfect. Um, I think someone is raising. Oh, it's still Michael. Oh, probably it's the previous one. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, I think I got one question. Um, yeah, he, he is asking. Uh, have you guys thought about using this technique on ischemia stroke? Um, since it's also a, um, a lot to do with vessels, have you thought about using, I think it's uh, um, about the indication. Have you thought about using that on acute stroke, ischemic stroke? Right. In fact, there are, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the DUOC01 um, uh, product, which was a, uh, a monocyte macrophage like cell line um, obviously immortalized, um, and that went into trials for stroke, and I'm not sure where it is at the moment, but it is, it is something that people have certainly thought about. And given, given our focus, we are unlikely to step outside um, 
outside atherosclerosis immediately, but uh, once we're a little further along, we're certainly going to be very interested in making partnerships for all the things that you can do with M2 phenotype macrophages in the body. Um, it's a very long list uh, of which stroke is, is one of the more obvious ones. And I think somebody asked in chat um, how long IP the IPSC, we don't inject IPSCs, we inject uh, monocytes derived from IPSCs. How many, how long do they last in the body? You know, these, this is well known in mice and humans. It's, um, you know, it's on the order of a few months at the outside. So you obviously, you have to equip them with suicide genes if you're going to put them into humans rather than mice. Um, and the dosage is yet to be established. Um, actually, embarrassingly, our, our maximum tolerable dosage is yet to be established because this therapy is so safe that we've, we've yet to manage to kill mice with um with the number of cells that we're actually injecting in them you can you can literally inject a mouse with a hundred times the normal circulating complement of monocytes and the mouse is fine um it's, it's a very safe therapy i think i still have a question from the audience um just sent to me um it's asking have you thought about if the levels of the cholesterol is too low um, probably is going to be a problem for um, for the other condition. Do do uh, have you thought about the balance for the cholesterol level? I mean, also um, things. So we we don't inject cells into the brain um, because that's one area where that might be a concern. But as a as a rule, the way the the way our mechanisms work, they are only um, getting rid of excess cholesterol. It cannot it cannot reduce cholesterol below a certain a certain a certain operating level so uh, that's really the origin of the safety profile the very very good safety profile of this technology it really only gets rid of excess cholesterol okay um if you have more questions uh feel free to ask us later um we'll connect you guys later if you drop the email in my in my, in my email address or um we can connect you guys later uh, due to the time, um, I think that's it for um, for repair. Um, Thank thanks you. a lot, Reason, for coming here. A really wonderful presentation. Um, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, Fabian, you here? If you're here, please unmute yourself. I. Um, I'm, I'm here, yes. Are you, are you here? Okay. Yeah, actually, I just uh, made an um, introduction for you. I can do that again. Actually, for um, this for Nectin Therapeutics. Um, Nectin is developing a novel uh, monoclonal antibody directing towards members of the Nectin family, some receptors and ligands that have major roles in um, immune checkpoints for cancer therapy. So this um, novel antibodies are developed for treatments of solid and, and blood tumors. Um, today, uh, Fabian uh, Tenenbaum is going to talk about it. Um, uh, Fabian is writing here. Um, uh, floor is yours. You can share your slides. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a moment just to uh, find words. Uh, do you need to stop sharing for me to go or? Uh... Is that good, Michael? Can you see it? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. It's pretty good. Perfect. All right. So thank you very much for uh, hosting us. Uh, this is a short presentation just to give you a bit of a, an overview on uh, Nectin Therapeutics. Uh, so um, Nectin is an immune oncology, preclinical, very soon to be clinical company. Uh, we are developing uh, therapies to overcome resistance to approved immune oncology therapies by leveraging our unique insights into the Nectin pathway. And we do this in two main ways. Uh, part of our portfolio is in uh, next generation immune checkpoint inhibitors with a unique internal synergy to the portfolio.
and a number of antibody drug conjugates or ADCs for both solid and hematological cancers. Um, we have the majority of our assets are first in class. We have a couple of very interesting uh, best in class in the portfolio as well. The lead asset is entering uh, a trial in the United States next quarter, Q2, with uh, data starting to come out at the beginning of 2023. Uh, and uh, we're just actually about to announce early next week a clinical development partnership uh, funded uh, together with and funded by MD Anderson, uh, who selected our lead candidate as a first in class promising a new therapy in immune oncology. So we're very excited about, about this new partnership. We have a strong multidisciplinary team, lots of experience in drug development, immunology, and a strong investor base with a number of global uh, VCs. The company is an A round, will be heading towards a B round uh, later this year. The team is based both in Israel and in the United States. You can see the management uh, team here again, without getting into the specifics, stellar team, lots of successful experience um, and a number of oncological drugs approved, uh, a strong scientific advisory board on your right side uh, from major cancer uh, research institutions in the United States. Um, as well as some technical support on some of the uh, elements in our uh, pipeline that are unique to what we do, such as the ADC with lots of experience on, on um, that front as well. And if you step back for a moment, really what the company is about is uh, an effort to address the major issue in oncology today, which is despite all the progress that we've made, 80% of cancer patients do not respond to approved ICIs. And this is obviously an enormous market. Um, we know there are tumors that are hot, uh, that express PDL1. Uh, those tumors we expect to respond to the approved ICIs. Unfortunately, that's about 20% of the patients or less. For the other 80%, broadly speaking, there are two main reasons. You have escaped hot tumors, they do not express PDL1, or for other reasons, they do not respond or have stopped responding. They're resistant to approved ICI treatment. And in this case, the, the unmet need is really finding those next generation immune checkpoint inhibitors, those other levers on the immune system to allow the immune system to fight cancers uh, effectively. And then we have the cold tumors for which you don't have infiltration of the immune system, uh, obviously not, respons not responsive to uh, immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, and in this case, we believe the major unmet need here is to really identify, no identify novel targets, uh, differentially expressed target for next generation ADC technologies to attack the tumor directly. Uh, and that's essentially what we do. So you can see at the top, we take the escaped hot tumors, which are resistant to ICIs. We address those with the next generation of immune, immune check inhibitors, uh, which have demonstrated in the preclinic really robust uh, response, including in, in models that are refractory to all the uh, drugs that are approved today. And then for the cold tumors, uh, we have an ADC portfolio of novel differentially expressed targets offering excellent preclinical efficacy in a wide therapeutic window. And on the right side of the slide, you can essentially see a bit of a map. On the left, these, these are the current ICIs that are approved. So PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4, I'm sure you've heard about these before. We are focused here on a nectin pathway, uh, a number of very interesting targets. We're essentially engaging all of these. And as you can see, some of these target express on the tumors, they're tumor expressing targets, and some express on uh, the immune cells. And from a pipeline perspective, currently five very active programs are lead anti-PVR monoclonal high affinity antibody first in class, has a triple MOA, uh, this is the one that we're taking into the clinic uh, in collaboration with MD Anderson. Uh, right behind it, we have our anti-CD112R, also known as PVRIG. It's a best-in-class against solid tumors. Uh, the IND there will follow immediately thereafter in 2023. And then the bottom three in gray, you can see our PVR, our, I'm sorry, our ABC portfolio, 
um, to first in class, one best in class, uh, both against solid tumors and against hematological tumors. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about all these. And so just to mention uh, briefly uh, a little bit on each asset. So starting with our anti-PVR, uh, truly positioned to become the uh, lead, uh, the leading uh, therapy in next-gen um, immune check uh, inhibitions. Uh, the IND submission is going to happen this month, the first patient in mid-22, as we said. It has a unique triple MOA, which combines the blockade of TIGIT, which you can see here on the right side, uh, CD96, uh, and uh, very uniquely, it restores the expression of the activating protein DNAM1. And this is the first, uh, this is the first therapy uh, that addresses directly the DNAM1 axis and is able to increase expression of DNAM1 on the surface of these cells. So you get the triple uh, MOA by blocking PVR on tumor cells. We have monotherapy activity, including in PD-1 uh, refractory tumors, uh, and a really robust preclinical synergy uh, with the approved ICIs like PD-1, PD-L1, and a broad clinical utility. Uh, PVR uh, overexpression on cancers is known to be clearly detrimental to PD-1, PD-L1 response. And so if you look at the pie chart here on uh, the bottom right side, you can see the target patient population for our upcoming trial. And so we know that the vast majority of patients are refractory to PD-1, pd one therapy. Um, in the green areas are the patients that we are addressing. So we are going to look at patients that are known, their tumors are known to express PVR. So you can see PVR plus, uh, and they can either be PDL one positive patients who for some reason are not seeing a response to PDL1 or have stopped seeing a response, as well as PDL PDL1 negative patients who are actually not um, receiving uh, PD1, PDL1 therapy uh, simply because they do not express the protein. So that this is over 50% of the population of advanced solid tumors that we are addressing. From a data perspective, there's a tremendous portfolio um, that we have generated uh, both in vivo and in vitro. In this case, you can see uh, one in vivo um, set of data, specifically in a model that is resistant uh, to PD-1, PD-L1 therapy. And as you can see, um, the, uh, the, these tumors, these mice have been uh, treated with anti-PD-1, in this case, uh, Pembro, Keytruda. Uh, the leading anti-TIGIT uh, antibody that's currently in phase three by Roche, and then control. None of these have an effect on tumor growth, and anti-PVR is providing for a really nice response um, and um, um, preventing uh, increase in tumor volume uh, versus approved therapies and upcoming uh, TIGIT therapies. Of course, blocking PVR uh, blocks completely the interaction with TIGIT in the same way that a TIGIT blocker would do, but it adds the blockade of CD96 and the increased expression of DNAM1. And we have a lot of internal data showing the correlation between DNAM1 expression uh, and the activity of immune cells. Our next uh, therapy, our uh, anti-CD112R, best in class. This is an optimized therapy for what is now a clinical stage immune target in phase one. It's a potent CD112R uh, blocking agent, as you can see here uh, on the top right side. In this case, CD112R expresses on immune cells. Uh, significant improved immune cell activation through an active FC engagement that we have versus a competitor. Um, great synergy with our own PVR. Note that by blocking CD112R, we essentially are releasing Nectin2 up here to uh, act with DNAM1. And so potentially there is a novel, novel combination. You block PVR, you increase DNAM1 expression, you block CD112R, and you increase the interaction between Nectin2 and DNAM1, activating the immune cells. And then uh, really impressive standalone in vivo activity, uh, including in PD-1 refractory tumors. Again, in the bottom uh, right side here, you can see 
uh, the model in refractory PD-1 mice. We are the only CD112R um, candidate, as far as we know, that has been able to show a, a monotherapy response of this magnitude. This is about 70% and a real impressive result uh, in the, this, type of, uh, this type of model. And then from a T-cell activation, the graph speaks for itself. This is the competitor that's currently in practice in clinic. Uh, significantly more potent T-cell activation uh, with our therapy. And then on the ADC front, you know, broadly ADCs are, are essentially precision warheads designed to attack differentially expressed tumor targets. Uh, we do this through an antigen specific high affinity antibody backbone, which you can see in blue on the right side. And then we combine that with a novel linker that carries a cytotoxic payload. And the novel linker is designed to minimize the release of these very toxic payloads and circulation and deliver them very specifically uh, and precisely to uh, the right tumors. There are multiple therapeutic candidates for solid and hematological malignancies that we are addressing and that we've seen uh, strong results for in our models. Uh, we've demonstrated complete tumor regression, essentially equivalent to uh, complete response in a numer uh, numerous uh, tumor models uh, with a really nice, broad, excellent safety profile, which is critical in these, in these ADCs, which carry a very potent uh, cytotoxic agent. And in the bottom, you can see just a selection of some of the, of the data uh, on, the different, uh, on our different candidates, uh, glioblastoma with our NTX8090, uh, AML with our NTX1107 and breast cancer with our uh, 1105. And as you can see, really exciting, uh, potent results uh, starting from a pretty significant tumor at the beginning of the essay. And this is a little bit on uh, what the company is planning to do over the next three years. Lots of exciting assets and milestones entering to the clinic with our anti-PVR antibody. Um, first patient very soon, we're going to start combination uh, with a PD-1 therapy and then uh, expanding into um, the expansion part of the trial, both as a monotherapy and in combination uh, sometime later this year, followed by our, by our anti-CD112R uh, immediately thereafter. And then some exciting development in our ADCs. These are earlier on assets. Our work currently is to solidify the safety package with the lead candidates uh, so they're ready to go into the pre-IND meeting and later on into the clinic. Um, so from Highlight's perspective, we are developing, as I said, a pipeline of potent next-gen ICIs and ADCs, um, addressing resistance to approved therapies, about to become clinic in the very near future, exciting partnership with MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, um, and our best-in-class CD112R, potent standalone and synergistic activity with approved ICIs and, importantly, in our, with our own internal pipeline for a really interesting novel-novel combination and a growing portfolio of ADC programs, second-generation genera second ADC programs against very unique targets um, uh, with some very exciting results. Um, we're planning to go into our uh, B round uh, later this year, allowing us to uh, go into the clinic. It'll be led by our internal uh, shareholders and a couple of new uh, US based and European based investors looking forward uh, to get into the clinic and report results um, as we get into patients. And then happy to answer any, any questions. Thanks, Fabian. It's really um, nice presentation. Um, if you have any question, feel free to ask us anytime. Um, thanks a lot. I think I got a question from the audience. Um, let me see. Oh, it's asking the ADC. So um, T, uh, NTX ADC, um, can you just give more comments on that? Um, because there is really little data showing um, any efficacy or any uh, comparison with some other competitors. Um, can you give us more information on um, NTX ADC? Thanks. 
Yeah, so we currently, what I've showed here today is a portfolio of uh, three ADCs. Two of them, um, you can see the target for, one is an anti-PVR um, ADC, first in class for solid tumors. That was the data on GBM. We have data on, uh, on numerous other models. Uh, and then uh, the other one that I've shared with you today is an anti-nectin-4 best-in-class IDC. There is an approved therapy last year uh, called PATSIV for nectin-4 uh, with really impressive efficacy, uh, but uh, significant uh, um, dose and uh, dose-limiting toxicities. Um, and so... Um, for our best in class, we have a unique approach, uh, both in terms of the antibody that we use, the design of the backbone, um, the targeted affinity, as well as the next generation linker and payload to improve on that, expand that therapeutic window. On our anti-PVR and um, our undisclosed ADC, these are first in classes, so completely new targets, differentially expressed, um, in a number of, in a significant uh, number of both solid and hematological tumors. Again, the data that I've shared is just a snippet of what we have, uh, but the same type of strong, complete response uh, is something that we've seen across uh, a large number uh, of different models. All right. Um, there's another question asking the um, um, NTX 1088. Um, it's uh, specific on anti PVR uh, CD one one five five. Um, how specific that is? Is there any uh, biochemistry data to support it? Yeah, I think it's it, asking the affinity and uh, um, specificity. Yeah, it is. It is a very uh, specific high affinity antibody, um, and it is a result. The company itself is a spin out from a development in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and so the. Before forming Nectin, um, the university lab spent a couple of years in developing this antibody. Uh, we've conducted a significant set of studies, uh, preclinical, and then talks work in order to take this into the clinic. Uh, so we have significant data, including in non-human primates, uh, both showing um, a real nice uh, PD effect in uh, monkeys. We can actually track that in the periphery by seeing increased expression of DNM1 and PVR and, and measuring soluble uh, PVR um, have demonstrated an excellent safety profile. Uh, PVR is quite differentially expressed in, in, in mostly in tumor uh, targets, um, have those a couple of orders of magnitude above what we believe the efficient or uh, um, active dose will be in humans uh, with essentially no uh, safety uh, issues and a really nice biological response. Okay, cool. Um, thanks. I think there is another question from the audience. Is that right? Um, we cannot hear you. You got to unmute yourself. We still cannot hear you. Uh, Yushin, can you try to fix it? We cannot hear. You got to probably unmute, unmute from the laptop. I mean, alternatively, you can always um, uh, write it down or um, type it in the chat box so we can um, answer that for you. Right now, it seems like it's, um, um, we cannot hear you.
you know, just give it a couple of minutes. Sometimes it's, uh, No, son, uh, never mind. You just type it in the chat box so we can um, um, transfer the question later so we can connect later. It's, it's always an excuse for us to get connected offline, right? So it's it's good. <laughs> yeah, happy happy to have any uh, follow-ons, Michael. Appreciate it. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. It's an excuse people cannot um, resist for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so it's really nice talk, uh, Fabian, for your um, uh, for your presentation. Um, re 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 really nice job. We'll keep you posted if there's any more questions. Um, thanks, thanks uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, the next company is going to be um, Intramion. Um, Intramune is a clinical stage um, biotech company that, that is focused on food allergies. The company's product, Omeet, platform is based on well-accepted uh, principles of um, immune therapy. Um, Dr. Uh, Tria Sergi is going to talk about it. Um, Dr. Sergi, um, yeah. go ahead. The floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And Thank you for the invitation from, from Dan and yourself and, and for the QA and, and also a pleasure to be with the other presenters as well and also with Mike Shepard that did an excellent presentation. So an honor to be here today. So I'm, I'm going to share, I'll try to start with a video. Let's see if the technology follows us. Uh, you know, immunotherapy can be in any area, uh, oncology and other areas we are talking about the immunotherapy related to food allergies, which is, is a growing problem around the world. So I'll try to see if that works. And just please let me know if you can, if you can hear my presentation because the video might, might work or might not. Hopefully it will work. Like all children, Adeline learned to brush her teeth when she was a little girl. She brushed every day. One day, Adeline had peanut butter cookies and had a terrible reaction. She grabbed her throat, turned red, had trouble breathing properly, and had to be rushed to the hospital. Once there, Adeline and her family learned that she was allergic to peanuts. Her family talked to the doctor to learn how to treat this food allergy. They recommended a specially formulated toothpaste created by Intromune, which uses oral mucosal immunotherapy, also known as OMIT. OMIT uses the unique abilities of the lining of the mouth to retrain the immune system and reduce allergic reactions to food like peanuts over time. Adeline started using the OMIT toothpaste right away. Her daily schedule remained the same, going about her day, eating dinner, and of course, brushing her teeth. Adeline and her family noticed a significant difference in her reaction to peanuts as she continued the use of the toothpaste. One Saturday, years later, Adeline goes out to lunch with her friend, her friend sees her eating Thai food, typically prepared with nuts, and asks her if she's okay. Adeline reassures her friend she is fine and that she doesn't have those symptoms anymore. Intromune is developing this technology in accordance with FDA guidelines. OMIT offers the potential of a long-term solution for the 220 million, including 15 million Americans, who have food allergies. Joining us in this interview, we've got the two key men from Intramune, Bill and- We don't need that anymore. So let's go for the presentation. So as you see, uh, this, is, this is a little bit different than what we have uh, seen up to now. So the, the story in, in, our, in our world is, 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 is the opposite. No, we, we need to train the immune system not to react in front of certain um, proteins that are basically part of our diet. And, and the main uh, goal, the story you have seen is what, what we dream of, what we are working for. 
Uh, and the and as as you surely know, the problem is the overreaction of the certain people in front of certain proteins that are linked to uh, food allergens and and of course these uh, people live with fear because uh, any accidental exposure to one of these allergens may cause uh, an anaphylactic reaction. So where we are is 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 trying to avoid this uh, overreaction. We are not we are not looking for um, uh, letting people eat peanuts or eat any 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 product. What we're trying to treat here is the accidental exposure that uh, can create this anaphylactic reaction, of course, and that makes people live with fear, especially kids, you know, and, and, and everything that is related to that. Most probably in the audience and using the same um, concept, one of the other panelists said, most probably in the audience, there's people with uh, allergies, food allergies, or have families with food allergies. So the story of Intrimune starts with our, one of our founders, uh, Dr. Will Rusher, which is from Cornell here in New York. And, and, and he treats basically, he's a, is an ENT specialist and, and he treats basically um, respiratory allergies. And he developed through another company, which is the mother company of Intrimune, uh, this solution to provide the allergens through toothpaste. So this concept already exists uh, by um, the, the mother company of, of Intrimune. And then Intrimune was created to specifically work in the area of uh, food allergies. So the, the platform that is behind this development is, is, is very well known, it's very solid. And as you will see, the idea is that through this simple mechanism, uh, the delivery mechanism, where getting into a habit that everyone has, going every every day, one to three times a day, um, and, you know, brushing your teeth. So in something that we do every day, we are trying to train our immune system. And this is very important because when you think about kids and, and if you have close kids to you, you will know that routine and any kind of treatment you try to provide in a chronic way, it's extremely difficult to follow because they simply forget about everything. Uh, so something that gets into their daily routine that doesn't mean that they have to do something different, uh, have a highly probability of success. So that's the introduction about Intrimune. So it's it's making things simple, which uh, always works in life, correct? So the, 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 what we are developing is simple, it's safe, and it's effective. And we are trying to make people live without fear, which is extremely high when you think about an anaphylactic reaction that can put your life in risk. The team behind uh, Intrimune, it's, it's very well experienced. Uh, we have the... Uh, in, in, in putting all us together, we have raised over 8 billion in different uh, projects. We have collaborated over 160 life science deals, and we have successfully worked in dozens of clinical programs. We are trying to address an amendment, as we saw in the video, uh, that affects 220 million worldwide uh, in terms of food allergies, and including 32 million in the US. Peanut allergy is expected to grow 1,700 folds between 2017 and 2027, as published by Global Data, with a potential market of 7 billion only for, food, uh, for peanut allergy in the US. This is maybe the, for the ones that you have experience in investing in biotech, I would say this is most probably the most the risk biotech development you have seen in your life. It's really the level of risk is very low for a number of reasons I will share with you. The, fir the first uh, one is it's that our the delivery is simple that that guarantees adherence to the patient and that guarantees good good uh, market penetration. The second thing is that we went directly to phase one B. And that's uh, of, of course our API or our uh, our delivery is the platform and the API we're using our peanuts. So you, the, you are not requested, you, you cannot expect 
toxicity as it is, as we understand toxicity and as we um, understand all the complexity of uh, the development of, of more complex drugs. Basically here we are selecting the proteins that FDA considers and are well known consider as the, the ones that cause the allergy. And we are stabilizing these proteins through different uh, processes into our delivery platform and making sure that these uh, proteins are properly delivered through the uh, OMIT, which is what we call oral mucus immunotherapy. And, and the other good thing is that the mechanism of action is, is very well known based on university studies that show that food proteins in the oral cavity desensitize patients. So the concept is there. I mean, we are not inventing anything. We are basically putting all the knowledge through this platform to make it easy use for, for children and of course adults. Uh, th there's, uh, there's high returns expected. Uh, the only approved product by FDA is called Palforzia, uh, was acquired for 2.6 billion by Nestle before sales. And the product, uh, it, it's a very, it's a complex product. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, in fact, it's a capsule with peanuts inside, of course, with all the FDA standards. Take, take it, I, I try to explain it simple, but one of these clinical developments takes about $800 million to develop. So it's, it's, it's simple by concept, but of course you need to follow all the, all the processes. But this product, the problem that it has is that you, you need to open the capsule. First of all, it's a capsule. Again, kids, capsules, every day, they forget about these things. Then you have to open the capsule and you have to spread what it is inside that basically are peanuts, very well processed, into something that uh, you, you, yolks or whatever, uh, puddings or whatever you want to put it, mix it, and then put a lot of sugar and other things. So there's kids that are getting fatter just using this, this, this treatment, but it tastes peanuts. And when you are allergic to peanuts and something tastes peanuts, it, it just makes you crazy. And that's why there's, the, the, the market penetration of this product has been really difficult. In our case, and thanks to peanut allergy programs that we are following and associations uh, and all the relationship we have with Cupian and leaders, they all are really waiting for this product to become a reality because that, that the, 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 the way that it's going to be used is extremely easy and, and, and acceptable. Right now we are, as I said, in phase 1B uh, and we are now raising 45 million for the, the phase two. Sorry, because I have you here and I have the screen here. That's why I'm moving one, one side to the other. Yeah, and of those, we are thinking of having 15 million in debt. That's a little bit the summary. I'm going to now accelerate the slides to make sure I arrive on time. Uh, the team, well, there's clearly more than people than, than the ones you see here, but the, to say something about the founder, Michael Nelson, he, he is a lawyer and he comes from Barclays Bank and other places. And he was leading the investment in health for a number of years in, in Barclays. And he, and he was working also with technology transfer things and then get to know Bill, which is our inventor. And they set up all this, all this project. We have uh, uh, something that is a little bit strange. We have already a commercial, a chief commercial officer, steward, that comes from companies like ALK, AVO, which you know, it's, it's a very specialized company in allergy. And, and we have steward on board because we understand from the beginning, the need to build up the relationships and to listen to all the customer segments, to talk to the patients, to talk to the opinion leaders, to make sure that what we are developing exactly meets what the marketing is expecting. And then we have right now the most important activities is CMC, as you, you might imagine, uh, regulatory and, and all these uh, product development activities. So that's a little bit part of the team that we, we have on board. We also have, of course, advisors. We have business advisors led by Yotin Morango, which is a Wall Street uh, expert. And the science is led by Bill Reisacher, which, as I said, is the founder of the company, but also we have very well known specialists from Stanford and, and, and allergists and, and, and dental specialists. We have quite a, a lot of advisors around us. So the market already mentioned 22 million, 32 in the US, 26 adults, 6 million children. 
And you know, that's a very important thing. We have a platform to treat food allergy and we are only developing one product right now for one country, which is the US. But that gives you an idea of the potential of this company. We can, the same platform can be used in different uh, other food allergens. And we are now exploring uh, strategic partnerships with companies in Asia, in Europe that want to use our platform into other type of allergens that are more frequent in other parts of the world. So we are completely open to strategic partnerships and collaborations in other uh, areas as well. And of course, to bring our peanut product uh, to the rest of the world as well. That is all open and that's why we are in all the Congresses just pitching and making our story known to find investors and strategic partners. That's a little bit the numbers. Well, you know, numbers are very easy to do, but just to give you a sense, we have, and only the US only, as, as I said, we are now a little bit focused on the US market. And we have 6 million peanut allergic population in the US. Of those 1.6 are, are uh, kids, and it is mainly our population target. One of those 1 million is diagnosed and about 700,000 are seeking for treatment. So uh, those, this is really the, 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 the basic of our numbers. And Paul Forcia today is, is reimbursed at, at $10,000 per year. So you make a little bit the numbers, you can even think about the market of over 7 billion in the US only. So that's the beauty of our product uh, in terms of don't try to put peanuts in a toothpaste and give it to allergic person. But uh, that's basically the concept, very elegant, very simple, using what is called the oral mucosa immunotherapy. And I'm going to accelerate because I know Mike wants me to be on time. I'm not going to get into the science after listening to everything that I, I heard today. This is such a simple thing. Everyone understands that the lung cells are in the mucosa. They will take the proteins that we have stabilized and, and will bring to the lymph nodes. And then they will train our T cells not to uh, react in front of uh, future exposure. Uh, the oldest therapy we know is called SLEEP, and it, it's used and approved for allergens in the respiratory field, is everything under the, the tongue. It's sublingual. Whilst we, with the OMID, we, we target the entire oral mucosa, which we have clearly uh, a higher exposure of the protein. This is everything that's published with peanuts in SLEEP, which is extremely well known. And to give you an idea, we look for a very simple product monodose with the scaling up dosing that of course the allergies will be controlling and it will be a prescription drug of course uh, up to the dose that is the right dose for the patient uh, to give you an idea we are in one tenth of the dose that is used in the case of palforcia so the probability of uh, adverse effects in our case is extremely low in terms of patent we have 45 patents in two families covering uh, a global portfolio and basically taking care of the one family. It's basically on the toothpaste uh, uh, as uh, the combination of uh, the delivery platform for immunotherapy. And the other family is the stabilization of the allergens into the, the platform. We already are conducting a phase 1B study that we are trying to extend even to a phase 2 due to the good results we are having. Uh, the first, we published a press release last week saying that the first cohort didn't have any secondary effects. There were zero reports. Here you have a little bit about the story. Of course, this presentation is available to share. And, and we have done all this with a little money. Everything we have done up to, including phase 1B, uh, we have done with $6 million. In, amazingly uh, low figure for the ones that you know how cost is that to write to here. But of course, there's a lot of advantages of what I explained. And uh, right now we are fundraising 45 million that will let us go on on the, basically cost is clinical program phase two in children, already in children, and there's everything linked to CMC. We need to make sure that we can manufacture the amounts we need to manufacture onboarding uh, all the team we need to conduct this phase two and blah, blah, blah. So, that's that's why we are looking for this investment. And if this bar disappear, I will. Oh, perfect. So to give you an idea, we expect a valuation between four, three, four hundred million in six, twelve months when we when we have um, the data inflection points. 
Uh, our competitors like DBB, which is uh, targeting peanut allergies using a patch. Again, think about the delivery mechanism and the complexity. Had evaluation at the end of phase 1B of 145 million and immunomic, which is basically a DNA vaccine, got an evaluation of 500 million after phase 1B. As I mentioned, we target uh, potential developments in other uh, allergens in other parts of the world. So basically, one thing is what we're doing here in the US, but the, the potential of the company is huge. Uh, the story about the immune already mentioned 2.6 billion with all the problems that this, this product has. And uh, I'm almost done. And here you have a table that compares and blah, blah, blah. So I'm not going to get into details to make sure we have time for questions. So in summary, revolutionary drug delivery platform, uh, great efficacy expected uh, with uh, positive finance. We're already moving forward on the Series B, uh, expected to be really safe. We expect no, hopefully no secondary effects, no fears to anaphylactic reactions, and uh, the adherence will be uh, high due to the fact that we are getting into an existing habit, which is extremely important for kids. So that's the, well, if someone wants to read that, I don't think so. That's, that's all about the presentation. Thank you very much for your time and very happy to answer any question we have. Thank you. Hopefully- hey, Dr. Sergi, it's a really nice presentation. Um, are there any questions for um, Dr. Sergi? Thank you. Uh, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. I got a question. This is Mike. Hey, Mike. Oh, Mike, go ahead. Uh, hi. I, hi. I love this. Uh, Thank, you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things I, 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 I noticed, though, uh, you might have trouble charging people $10,000 a year for toothpaste. Uh, you're going to well, have to change their minds about things but well, um, that that was that was a joke um yes no but it has yeah, an answer but, if you want <laughs> I, I know i know that i don't i, I understand it though um so you're looking for approval as a drug and not as a device is that right yeah correct that's what the fda requires and that's and oh, it really? goes to, to the previous question this is not a toothpaste the toothpaste is a platform this is a drug that treats uh, peanut allergy. Exactly. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Uh, I would have thought maybe you could do it as a device, but I, I, I don't. There's I, no I have to look into that. Yeah. Thanks yeah. very much. And I'm sure you investigated that thoroughly. No yes, yes, yes. This is a prescription drug, 100%. The problem is the anaphylactic reaction. And, and this is the the tricky point here. So you, you are trying to, you know, you know, I'm not going to say anything because you are you are a high professor of all the immune system, but clearly this has to be very well controlled by allergists. And, and, the, and the problem is that overdosing generates uh, anaphylactic reactions and all the problems. So though for FDA, this is clearly a prescription drug and it needs phase one, phase two, phase three, which brings hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. That's, that's why this is not a toothpaste and not even, I can tell you that not, not non-toothpaste company will be interested in this because they don't target allergists. And the only way to sell this is with prescription and control by an allergist. Thank you, Mike, for the question. I think it's great, thank you. That, that's a very good point. Everyone asks ask about that. We say, ah, oh, this is a toothpaste. No, no. The beauty is the platform and the simplicity. <laughs> this, is, this is a drug, <laughs> okay. prescription drug. Uh, just a follow-up question to to Michael, so what is the, like the business model, for example? Are you doing the toothpaste by yourself or are you trying to collaborate with some other companies, like try to do a, like collaboration um, for, for this product? What is like the uh, royalty stuff, uh, how, how, how that works? Yeah, no, I mean, again, this is not, uh, some people tend to think about toothpaste and well, P&G or Unilever could be interested, I can tell you they are not. <laughs> <laughs> and I know so well. I, I'm a professor at the Foresight, which is an oral uh, oral health institute, and we get to we know very well all these people. They know the project, by the way. But this is not the toothpaste. This is a prescription drug. So 
the beauty is the, the, the use. No, so what we are developing house everything, uh, but uh, we are looking, as I said, no, so we are, you know, all our resources, it's hundreds of millions to just bring one product to the market, one uh, food allergen. So we are, what we're doing now, it's, it's just uh, aside of the fun, fundraising, which is, which is our, of course, main goal, but now we are opening the discussions with companies all around the world to uh, build that collaborations and co-development agreements in, in China, in South Korea, in Japan, in, the, in Europe, anywhere in the world that where companies can take the platform and continue the development and develop, because you know, allergies change, even peanuts are different in, in the Mediterranean countries rather than in the US, they have different expression proteins and things like that. But you know, there's so many allergies, there's so many things to be done, no? in, in, you know, so we are working on all that to build up uh, collaborations all around the world, and that's basically my role. Yeah, here. thanks. I mean, if you're interested in the Chinese market, probably later we can get also get you connected with a lot of partners. Absolutely. They'll certainly be interested for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Sergi. So it's a really nice presentation. Look forward to connect with you uh, offline later. So um, thanks a lot for for being here today. Been a pleasure. Thank you for your invitation. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Same. Um, okay, the next next um, company is going to be um, Sevenas Therapeutics. Uh, Sevenas Therapeutics is a biotech company that develops um, a therapeutic platform that is designed to treat um, immune-related disorders. Uh, the cargo site platform at uh, Sevenas has various applicant uh, applications as it, it can be engineered to target specific tissues and it can and deliver strategic therapeutic payloads. And today the founder and CEO, Remo uh, Mo, uh, Momie um, Kaya is going to talk about it. Um, so uh, Remo, the floor is yours. Hopefully I didn't spell your last name so wrong. <laughs> no, that's fine. Apologies. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for the invite to present today. Uh, at Cytonis Therapeutics, everything we do, we do to challenge the status quo for our patient outcomes. How we are breaking with dogmas within biopharma is to challenge the way we think about drug delivery and the principles of biodistribution, pharmacokinetics, therapeutic efficacy, and most importantly, patient safety. We believe we're launching a, an entirely new revolution in science. Uh, first, uh, as, the, uh, as the name of the uh, drug delivery platform, Carbocyte, indicates, this is a cellular vehicle that is capable of carrying multiple types of therapeutic cargos or therapeutic payloads. The problem we are solving is that of toxicity. Uh, we believe that a uh, precise vehicle that can deliver therapeutics and localize uh, therapies at sites of the disease or at sites where tissues are needing therapeutics while minimizing systemic exposure to those therapeutics is going to be a breakthrough uh, in not only uh, efficacy rates, but also getting a new line of therapeutics that are safer and more efficacious. The way in which we uh, make cargo sites that makes this very unique and different, uh, we're taking a tremendous amount of bioinformatic information regarding biomarkers of different types of diseases. We are then taking our starter cell, which in uh, first-generation carbocytes is based off of mesenchymal stem cells. We are engin reverse engineering those cells to express a multitude of different types of chemokine and adhesion molecule receptors. And that is done in, first, in the first step. And the second step, which is probably the most critical, is that we are now enucleating these cells. The dangerous DNA that we put into those cells in, in step one 
has very little uh, need or purpose moving forward. So um, in the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more details about some of the other aspects of enucleation and, and their consequences. In the, third cell, in the third step, what we do with the cargo site at this point is we load it with a therapeutic payload, taking advantage of all of the cytoplasmic organelles that are intact. And ultimately this becomes a precision delivery vehicle that can be given IV that homes, migrates, extravasates, and penetrates deep into tissue and produces a product at the site of the disease and not systemically. In this slide, uh, I'll go a little bit into why enucleation is, is important. So um, think of a, a, a cell that has a nucleus as a bowling ball inside of a balloon. If you remove that bowling ball, the balloon becomes extremely malleable. The enucleation process uh, does this morphologically to the cells, but it has a, a number of other consequences that are very important. An enucleated cell has no capability of any further differentiation. It has an, uh, a very good control mechanism because it has a three to five day half-life. It, it survives for three to five days. Um, there is no further possibility of unpredictable cell differentiation. And most importantly, the cell, the cargo site, has no capability of making new proteins while uh, in, an, in, a, in an environment. In this slide, um, the next few slides, I'm gonna show you some data. So I wanna just set up the experiments so that they make sense. Here um, in our oncology lead, uh, we are engineering cargo sites uh, to produce a very well understood uh, immune modulator interleukin-12. We're doing this via an mRNA approach and we're using the cargo site to produce IL-12 locally. IL-12 is, uh, is, a, is a molecule that's been known in science for well over 25 years. Um, it, like many other cytokines, is extremely toxic and has uh, been relegated to only um, um, localized use uh, because of that toxicity. And this model for, um, um, uh, uh, in this animal model, which is the EO77 cell line, closely resembles uh, triple negative breast cancer in humans. Uh, it's a very nice model. We inject these cells um, into uh, fully immune competent mice. Uh, about 10 days later, we know that these cells metastasize to the lung. Um, and we start a regimen of three injections uh, intravenously. Um, and we do some data analysis along the way. Uh, this is a, a high resolution um, confocal microscope image that I think speaks a thousand uh, words. Here we took uh, after one single dose, uh, after 10 days, um, we uh, sacrificed the anim this animal and uh, did sections of imaging through their lung. In the top A panel, you see the metastatic tumors. These are micro metastatic diseases dyed red. Below that, you see the same uh, layer with cargo sites that are dyed green. And when we merge the two images on the bottom, you see a very nice uh, blanketing of the green cargo sites on top of the red uh, uh, metastatic tumors. However, when you look closely in emerged um, and magnified images, you see not only red and green, but you see quite a lot of yellow. The yellow is the cargo site penetrating into the tumor microenvironment of this, uh, of this animal. This is what we believe to be a true vertical move in science. To quantify this, um, in this, in this slide, uh, the panel A demonstrates that after a single dose of IL uh, cargo site producing IL-12, uh, we have more than a 70% decrease 
in the tumor, uh, tumor uh, metastatic um, load. In panel B, we also quantify this using uh, bioluminescent imaging. And you see a very nice um, decrease in um, the metastatic load uh, that is demonstrated in those bars. Now, interestingly enough, um, if you look at the blue bar, this is essentially PD-1 inhibitors by themselves. And one of the other uh, presenters made a very good point that PD-1 inhibitors uh, do not work for most uh, cancers. Here, what we're demonstrating is that in combination with IL-12, we are able to enable PD-1 inhibitors to have a positive effect on these animals. So this, uh, I assume, will be a very great interest to a lot of companies who are making PD-1 inhibitors. And uh, in panel C, um, what you see are the pathology sections of these animals. So the top image is uh, clearly a, a, a regular normal um, lung lobe. Uh, the middle one is very interesting because it, it is the untreated animal. I want to note the metastatic load to this organ is immense. However, even after 21 days um, on the lower image, you see a massive reduction in the tumor uh, uh, load pathologically. You see a re-architecture that is more similar to the normal lung as well. We are a company that's based uh, on our oncology roots. Um, we have uh, a, a very wide and broad um, pipeline, and we're going to file our first IND this year, be in clinics at the beginning of next year, if not the end of this year. And uh, we are uh, building a number of collaborations, uh, both on the private and public side to advance this uh, platform. Often a lot of people ask us, well, you know, what about other drug delivery platforms and how do you compare to them? Well, we believe that we are a first in class, um, uh, completely new and different approach. Uh, simply stating the, uh, the column on the left, we believe are the most important aspects of building a uh, cell-based uh, therapy. And we have all of the attributes that I think you need to make a solid, solid new approach. Interesting, uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, as I grow as a CEO, I realize the importance of manufacturing. Um, cell therapies are very difficult to manufacture. And we have a number of advantages, starting with uh, the fact that we use immortalized cell lines to begin with, um, and the fact that we can cryopreserve these cells makes our uh, manufacturing process actually extremely robust. About 80% of the process is standardized, 20% is customized. The customization is the bottom left-hand box. Um, we have a, a wide variety of different therapies that we are delivering. Um, and producing in vivo. We very much like mRNA-based technologies. We have active programs with antibodies, nanobodies, cytokines, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and a number of peptides and proteins. We also have the very distinct advantage of delivering oncolytic viruses and have a very robust interest um, and some early proof of principle about using our cargo sites as a non-viral gene editing approach as well. Um, we started this company at the beginning of 2020 uh, when the pandemic hit. And one of the things we were very concerned about was our capability of raising money. Uh, my co-partner, uh, Richard, Professor Richard Klemke and I decided that we were going to advance this technology no matter what. I'm very proud to say that in the last 18 months, we have received six grants, five NIH grants across three different institutes and one uh, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. This to us is a 
very good indication that there's a lot of excitement about this new and exciting approach. We are in the process of building our own uh, manufacturing center. Um, despite raising a modest amount of money, uh, you might ask, this might not be a, a very good move. But the reality is, in, in two and a half years of this company, I have uh, asked um, every CDMO company I could ever contact from Lanza, Wuxi, Fuji Films, and all sorts of smaller companies, whether they could make a cargo site. And after three weeks of due diligence, I've never received one uh, quote on that work. This is actually a blessing for our company. Um, we are the only ones who can make this product. And, in, in, and this opens up a entirely new vertical business model for us for licensing and co-developing that we otherwise couldn't do economically using a CMO. We have a very strong patent portfolio. We've done two freedom to operate analysis already. Um, we've been uh, accepted to a variety of different competitions uh, like tonight's uh, uh, presentation as well. I'm very happy to participate in all of them. Uh, it is my job to educate the world about this new approach. And it's taken me to China uh, multiple times. And very happy to say that I've already won a, a presentation a competition in China. And I uh, very much hope that the pandemic ends very quickly so that I can return uh, there as well. We have a very well established uh, um, core of scientists and um, visionary uh, business people who are part of this company. Um, Professor Richard Klemke is the co-founder. He's the visionary of the platform. He has been working on this for now almost seven years uh, through his academic role at UCSD. Um, and we've managed uh, to get the attention of luminaries, uh, both in the science world, as well as the translational oncology world. We have an ongoing collaboration with MD Anderson as well. And uh, we're very excited about um, the next year when we bring our first cargo site to the clinics. If you'd like to reach me, I'm, I'm available via WeChat. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Remo. Re a really nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any questions uh, for uh, Remo? I got one question. Um, it's asking your um, manufacturing right now, because you mentioned the manufacturing, the CMC is kind of like a challenging for almost every pharmaceutical companies, but right now, how do you deal, how are you dealing with the manufacturing right now in the United States? Yeah, so we're, we're building our own facility to do that in uh, San Diego, California. Um, so we, we've optimized this process very well, and we're in the process of translating that into um, GMP quality uh, processing for, the, the, for our first IND and, and first clinical product. Um, there is a question um, from Chinese that is asking the, um, mucoso, the uh, immuno, like the indication. I'm sorry, Michael. Could you repeat um, that? He is asking. He is asking for the, the cargo side, the mechanism for car, car, uh, cargo side. So, I think you already um, answered. But he just wanted to be more uh, specific, like how uh, the cargo side is working. Um, yeah. So the cargo side itself is uh, is the vehicle. Um, it's important to understand that the actual therapeutic we're delivering uh, is produced by that cell, the cargo site, in vivo at the site of the disease. 
So um, the cargo site is the mechanism uh, that enables uh, therapeutics to be uh, safer and more controllable. Um, and, and that is ultimately the role of the cargo site. Uh, what kind of sales you're using? A, a question in the chat box. Yeah, so our first generation cargo site is based off of mesenchymal stem cells, uh, but we have broad patent coverage over every nucleated cell line. So we're developing second and third generation cells uh, for this purpose as well. There is reason to believe that um, there are other cell lines that are, are potentially better for different indications. Gotcha. Any other questions? Um, there's a question asking the elimination for the cargo site afterwards. Um, is there any uh, data for the PKPD afterwards? Thanks. Yes, yeah, there is. Um, so this is the beautiful aspect of this approach. These cargo sites, uh, they live for three to five days. Um, the best we understand the way in which they're eliminated is that they go, in, they go senescence and are uh, eliminated naturally by macrophages. We know this uh, extensively, the characteristics of this cell uh, over the last six, almost seven years now, we know that this is very reproducible. Um, the, the reason why that is super important and is often overlooked is because as a clinician, I know that I want to be able to dose and redose patients uh, when I need to. The, I think the, the major problem and differentiator between uh, current cell therapies is the fact that um, all sorts of cell therapies currently um, embed and uh, 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 permanently engraft into tissues. And now uh, we know that there's a lot of downstream problems that happen because of that uh, action including autoimmune diseases. Quite a lot of this is now being published um, after you know, a decade or so of uh, CAR-T, for example, uh, being out there in, in, in humans. So these are, the, these are the beautiful control aspects of the cargo site that um, is inherent in this process of the enucleation of these cells. Gotcha, thanks for your answer. Uh, due to the time, if you have any more questions, feel free to leave us in the chat box. We'll connect your guests later. Um, thanks, Remo. It was a really nice presentation tonight. Um, really glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, the next company is going to be um, AVM Biotechnology. Um, um, it's a clinical stage company advancing AVM 0703 in treatment of cancer, autoimmune disease, and infectious disease. AVM 0703 could be the uh, first choice for no option cancer um, and infectious disease. Today, the founder and CEO, uh, Joe uh, Luminillo, is going to talk about it. Um, Joe, are you with us? I'm, I'm with you, Michael. Can you, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Yeah, we can. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Right, perfect. Uh, just a couple of quick, quick things. First of all, Michael, thank you and the team for, for having us uh, here this evening. I'm not the founder, but our founder is with us. Uh, Teresa is our chief scientific officer. Um, she could not log in, Michael, as a presenter. If you can find her as the observers uh, for the question portion. Um, normally, we do this together, but given the time constraints, we thought that just one of us would, would fly through the slides for you or with you. But uh, obviously, for any science questions, Teresa's the, Teresa's the person to go to. Um, yeah, just, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, our lead product, ABM0703, is a rebuilt version of dexamethasone. And because of that, we have the ability to not only be in the, uh, at FDA now in clinical trials, but also we have a compassionate use program. And th this is just to me, remarkable. I, I've, I've been in the business 35 years. Many of you have been in the business a long time. But this is a patient uh, from just a couple of weeks ago, 84-year-old patient diagnosed with a CNS tumor in, in mid-January. 
uh, confirmed by biopsy to be an aggressive squamous cell. These pictures are really in minutes. The top left, you can see his eye is pretty shut, the, the tumors behind his eye and causing um, a lot of pressure on the eye. This is only uh, an hour and 15 minutes later. You can see changes already. In fact, anecdotally, the nurse said in 30 minutes, she could see differences. Uh, going down to the lower left, this is the next day, but less than 24 hours later. And all the way to the right is two days later. Um, again, anecdotally reported discoloration where the cancer was behind the skin and nowhere else on the face. So the effects, and this, this tracks with our animal model data, this tracks with um, what we see with a very speedy invasion of the tumor uh, from a natural killer T cell that we mobilize in vivo. In fact, that's kind of our secret sauce. We have a small molecule, uh, a, a rebuilt dexamethasone, which does not operate in the glucocorticoid receptor uh, mechanism at the doses we employ. And it mobilizes endogenous bispecific gamma delta TCR invariant uh, natural killer T-like cells. So um, no facilities to build, no business model problems, no autologous problems, problems no graft versus host disease problems. Uh, it's very elegant and very simple. Uh, we have durable responses in our, in our clinical program in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which we'll show you in a little bit, including T cells uh, that have lasted now it's greater than 5.5 months on the order of seven months. We've not had any dose limiting uh, uh, AEs in the program. And we have uh, leveraged the well-established clinical pathway for uh, breakthrough therapy we'll apply for, but an ex uh, expedition FDA and regulatory approval. And we have data in, uh, in preclinical that shows that we potentiate chemotherapy and CAR-T responses in, in the animal models. Uh, the team, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Deicher on the left is, is the founder, the heart and soul of the company, and our chief scientific officer. She's an industry uh, scientist, worked in a lot of different companies, uh, developed a lot of molecules, has over 47 issued passion, patents. Uh, I'm Joe Luminello, as I mentioned, almost 35 years on the commercial side. I'm not a scientist, um, but have, have been around long enough to understand how to translate medicine into business. We think we can launch in 2023, probably towards the back end of 2023. So Brian's our chief commercial officer, getting us ready for commercial launch. And Pearl is an outstanding CFO and has multiple exits underneath her belt. We're seeking 65 million total to get us from here to commercial launch, which is a lot of money. But as you know, in pharma talk, it's not a lot of money. 5 million bridge uh, financing, 20 million and then 40 million in two different tranches. The 20 million gets us to finish, uh, well, not finish, but sufficiently move the clinical program forward such that we would have the first NDA submitted. And then the 40 million tranche would be for commercialization. Now there's a lot of talk uh, recently, probably in the last six months about gamma delta cells, uh, a lot of IPO uh, press, a lot of buyouts, just a lot of activity in the, in the space. We kind of view gamma deltas and natural killer T cells as, I don't know, the next evolution in IO therapy in cancer. And as I just mentioned, while this is really very exciting, these companies are cell companies. And even though tonight we've had a lot of great presentations by cell-based companies, we all have to acknowledge some of the difficulties with the business model. Uh, and with the science. And so we feel as though that the simple small molecule that we have, which induces and mobilizes these naturally occurring uh, natural killer T cells will have safety and efficacy advantages, targeting advantages, and as well as business model advantages. A little bit more about the cell. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's bispecific. And because it's bispecific, it has potential in more than one therapeutic area. So for example, we just recently received notice of uh, a grant, $2 million from NCI to help us with our clinical program, but also $1.7 million to look at type one diabetes. Again, just illustrating 
I guess, the versatility of the cell that we, we induce and mobilize. Um, it kind of bridges the gap, as you know, the, the natural killer T cells bridge the gap between the innate and the adaptive immune system. And um, we have data, preclinical data that shows that we have, uh, or we, we encourage in the animals uh, memory. So we had a, a graph, we treated the graph, the, the cancer, the patient, the doctor, sorry, <laughs> the animals had a complete response. We then uh, tested the animals again by inducing another graph, no therapy, the, the, own, the animal's own immune system recognized the cancer and destroyed the cancer. And as you know, NKT cells are highly toxic by themselves, but really the power of them is in bringing in uh, their immune system friends, the B cells and the T cells. Uh, and this again happens very rapidly as we saw from that patient in the beginning. Just a little bit about, uh, we call it the AVM NKT cell because we don't believe it's been described in the literature. Uh, in healthy animals, you cannot find the cell really. Uh, a lot of times, and Teresa would be better to qualify to talk about it, but as I understand it, when you're doing flight cytometry, you sort of have to have gates in the system to understand what you're looking for. And if you're not looking for the AMD NKT, you won't find it. So a little bit of serendipity on our part in the way it was discovered. But clearly we understand that uh, there are CD49B positive and CD3 very bright compared to known NKTs, which express, express the CD3. So um, we also know that we have a good 49B here. And as you see down here, the APC CY7. And as well as on the right, you can see, if I just move this for myself, uh, we have CD3 and Li6G levels required for the, uh, for the tumor attacking or encircling or enveloping the tumor. And these are those dark cells here on the right. These two slides or these two um, slices of the histology here, can't seem to get my thing to move, thank you. Um, on the left, and these, there's not, this is not a time sequence. This is not the same tumor over time. They're two different tumors, two different sizes of tumors. But just illustrating on the left, you see the living tumor in the light purple, uh, and you see some tumor is killed in the brown in the top right. This is the, this is the animal's own immune system trying to take care of the tumor, but as you can see, it's really not sufficient to the task at hand. There's plenty of cancer in there. Whereas on the right, we've destroyed 99% of the tumor cells after a single dose after 48 hours. As I mentioned, we're in the clinic. Um, we're using an adaptive design expansion protocol in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We also have an IND open in uh, acute respiratory disease, but we are not pursuing that at this time. It's still open and we can do that, but we're not pursuing it at this time. We're hyper-focused on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we've had great success with FDA. Um, we have a dose escalating, as you would expect, starting at six mg per kg. And based on safety, the FDA has allowed us twice to amend the protocol to shorten the duration between patients and shorten the duration between cohorts. And in fact, allowed us to eliminate the 15 mg per gig uh, group completely. Um, we're two patients short of finishing the safety portion of the protocol before we move on to efficacy. And the design is to um, look at subtypes or buckets of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're currently contemplating five buckets. And each one of those buckets, the statistics stand on their own. So uh, we seem to have really good efficacy in T cells, which we'll cover in a minute. But let's just say we enroll the T cell uh, patients first and the data comes in. We apply to FDA for conditional approval in T cells. If the mantle cell is still going on, it's independent of T cells. If the diffuse large B cell is still going on, it's independent of the other two. So the statistics for each one of the subsets stands on its own. And our intent is to submit to FDA for approval in each one of those subsets as the data becomes available. Here's some patient data from the safety portion of the protocol. It's a pretty busy slide, um, but I just want to draw your attention on the left it's dose escalating, so six mg per kg up to 18 mg per kg. Uh, we really don't think efficacy, we didn't think expect efficacy, efficacy below 18 mg per kg, perhaps at 15 or 12, but we started seeing efficacy at nine milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and you can see here, 
with the, uh, the months of durable, uh, durability on the bottom, we're, we're doing really well. Now these patients are relapse refractory. They have no option. On average, they've failed five courses of therapy already and essentially are dying. You can see here, we have some, a lot of T cell activity here, here, uh, one down here. So it's really amazing the breadth of the effect. Um, and it seems that, that as though the molecule is a bit agnostic to specific markers or specific antigens. It seems to just understand cancer cells, distress cells, phosphoantigens, and goes after it. I just want to highlight the 18 milligram patient at the top, which again, we think is our therapeutic dose. They essentially had one dose of our drug uh, and are now almost six months with one single one and a half hour infusion of our drug and have had a durable response. You can see some of these patients here, this triangle means T cell therapy. Uh, a lot of the symbols mean they've gone on to different therapies. These count, these patients are dying when we get them. Their immune systems are highly compromised. They don't qualify for anything else. We get them into a condition where, again, the 18 milligram patient stands alone on a single dose, but even if they can move on to chemo or radiation or T cells, that's a big win for them. Uh, and it's a big win for the, for, the, for the company and the molecule. Now, just wanna draw your attention to uh, this, this patient down here, a B cell ALL. Um, we call him the tractor guy. Uh, he received a nine milligrams per kilogram dose. He had a CNS uh, cancer involving his optic nerve. He was blind and dying, blind in both eyes. He received a single uh, nine milligram dose and in three days his vision was restored. And apparently he's a farmer because his physician reported him back on his tractor. This result plus the patient we saw in the beginning is really amazing and gives us a lot of uh, good optimism about the outcomes of the trial. Just a little bit about uh, the opportunity. We're very focused on uh, getting into market, proof of concept, uh, revenues, and supplying those dollars into the rest of the pipeline. So the first approval that we anticipate uh, is an ALL. It could very well be one of the T cells. We've, we've since this data has become available, we've tried to recruit centers that are T cell centric because of the remarkable um, results that we have. As you know, T cells are very difficult to treat, particularly the refractory. Um, you can't really use T cell therapy with T cell cancers. So that's probably going to end up being recruiting first. However, as, uh, as an illustration here, the ALL market, again, just in relapsed refractory patients, is well over $3 billion in the US, probably a similar number in Europe, and just a little bit less uh, in the Pacific Rim minus China. Now, again, dexamethasone, uh, Teresa and the team uh, basically rebuilt it, took out the alcohols, took out the parabens. Uh, we basically got API by itself, um, and yet we still have 36 to 48 month stability. There's a little bit, oh, there's a lot of it actually, of IP and manufacturing know-how that goes into the, our ability to take out all those preservatives and all that stuff that causes the AEs in the patients and yet have a stable product uh, three and four years out. Very simple to make, relatively inexpensive to make. We do have a good patent state, a lot of patent families, Teresa's led this way. Um, the 105 patent is the formulation patent, as not yet issued, but we expect it to be. We received notification from Europe just recently that we'll probably get allowance in a, a wide uh, uh, bunch of claims. We've also started developing the patent estate around the natural killer T cell, obviously not the cell itself, but the mechanisms by which we activate it. So in sum, um, Single dose of ABM0703 can induce the body to mobilize these endogenous bispecific gamma deltas. Um, it's highly de-risked. Uh, one of the other presenters mentioned uh, being de-risked. If we think about safety and efficacy, we've got that covered. It's not completely de-risked, of course, but it's significantly de-risked. The clinical pathway and the, market, the regulatory pathway are significantly de-risked. 
And really now the, the major risk remaining is in commercialization. And we're preparing to do that now uh, with the hiring of uh, Brian and with Pearl. Just a bit about the scientific team. Uh, obviously, Teresa knows a lot of folks uh, in the field. On the left is um, Ed. Ed's our chief medical officer and runs the Compassionate Use Program. And across the top are various experts in gamma delta T cells or lymphomas um, and manufacturing, actually. So I think I went pretty quickly. Uh, hopefully I've left time for answers and hopefully we've got Teresa to help out uh, and got her into the pre presenter's mode. Uh, hi. Hi, Joe. It's, it's, it's a really good presentation. Um, thanks for uh, for the time. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Michael, did you happen to get uh, Teresa on so I know whether or not I'm stepping on her or no? What? Did you happen to get Teresa into the present presenter's mode or no? Um, no, 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 no. I, I have to okay. convert, convert. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. All right, I'll do my best. <laughs> Michael, don't, Michael, don't give me tough science questions, please. <laughs> Which Michael? <laughs> uh, Dr. Shepard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or you actually, Michael. <laughs> um, okay, I got a question. Is asking the AVM 0703 um, for the half-life, the IC50. Do you have any ideas for the PKPD um, in the animals or in the cells? Thank you. Uh, uh, we don't have we don't have that data. We're leveraging, of course, um, the safety profile from Dex originally. And we have a bridging strategy with these first patients here, that uh, safety patients will do PKPT on, on the lower doses to bridge the data to, so that we understand its relationship to the original DEX. So we'll get that soon. Uh, we don't have the animal PKPD. Okay. Um, I think there is a question from the audience. Uh, Teresa? You can unmute yourself. Is that my Teresa? Hello, it's your Teresa. That's Teresa. <laughs> That's Dr. Dyser, our chief scientific officer. Can you hear me? I we can, <sighs> Teresa. Thank you. Okay, I'm here. Perfect, Michael. I wanted to. Uh, uh, I know I didn't get a question about it, but uh, the dexamethasone in our formulation is really nothing like the the dexamethasone that's uh, available. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give you a, like a ratio, uh, perhaps an oncologist will prescribe maybe 20 milligrams a day, maybe as high as 40 in a, in a bad case. Uh, we've had a prostate cancer patient on therapy, stable on therapy for a year at uh, a gram and a half in an hour and a half mm -hmm. infusion. So it's just orders of magnitude different. The technology around uh, the violing um, and the patent state is just two different things, really, two different drugs. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Dr. Shepard, you got a question? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, this, uh, this is uh, pretty amazing. Um, there are some diseases which, um, like sarcomas, that uh, could really benefit from something like this. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, Though, if if you have any publications, I just I'm being lazy asking you to tell me <laughs> where I can find a publication. So, so yeah. can I can I address that? Yeah, please do, sure. Teresa. Yeah, no, as a biotech company or pharma pharma company, we we take care of our IP first, and um, we are actually just now preparing publications. So we have had impact against. Uh, many different cancer types, prostate cancer, glioblastoma, squamous cell, central nervous system, a very aggressive, poor prognosis patient, and then uh, multiple non-Hodgkin's lymphoma indications. We have a very active compassionate use program, 
and the FDA, US FDA is approving treatment in 48 hours. They're very supportive because of the safety and the efficacy profile. And we are now starting to work on our publications because we believe we have our IP solidified. We have very strong IP. We have withstood third-party challenges. And uh, now we're turning to publications. Okay. Um, I have a question about the the HE staining, probably in your um, presentation, you showed the HE staining, right? Is there any uh, immunohistochemistry data, like more um, specific to certain biomarkers? So Thanks. we have data from our patients and our clinicians are really actively pursuing this. Um, we have reports of just phenomenal immune regeneration or reset. So in our dose escalation phase, we started at one third of our target therapeutic dose, and yet our patients had a benefit. And they had a benefit because their health and their clinical status improved and their immune profile improved. So we see reductions in exhaustion markers and um, patients that previously did not qualify for CAR-T because they could not make a good CAR-T product became candidates for CAR-T. So that data we are accumulating. Yeah, and also, um, I mean, talk, uh, talking about the product, the EVM0703, um, do you have any idea what is the protein target for this um, small molecule? I believe it's a small molecule, right? What is the... Yep target, did, did you do any targeted convolution work? We have, and we, we continue to learn about this. So there's um, precedent for dose dependent receptor preference in the FGF family, and we see it in the same family. So for instance, in the FGF family, when you administer low doses, you bind and activate the high affinity FGF receptor. At high doses, you lose that activation because extremely dense, low affinity heparin sulfate soaks it all up. And we have identified a similar receptor system for our drug and our selective effects. Okay, yeah, looking forward to, to have the like specific protein target. That will be very interesting. Do we have, uh, we do have, we're working on the hypothesis and Teresa's tracked down what we believe it to be. And mm -hmm. with this, with this uh, Dr. Shepard just brought up the publication situation with, with the CDA, we'd be happy to talk about it some more. Okay, cool. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? Okay, so... Um... Uh, thanks a lot, Remo. It's uh, sorry, Joe. It's it's a great presentation. Um, it's wonderful. We certainly learn a lot. If there is more questions, I uh, will connect you guys later. Um, yeah, we're really glad that we have you here tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. We look forward to additional questions and conversations. Thank you, Joe and Teresa. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> um, Okay, so that's uh, pretty much about it. Thanks for the participation today. Uh, really glad to have the all of the startups, investors in both the United States and in China on here. If you have any interest in any of these companies, feel free to contact us. I will be surely connecting you guys. Um, you can always reach us by email. You can see uh, our info email address in the chat box right now. Uh, we'll have more events coming this summer. Of the direction will probably be cardiovascular disease or orphan disease. Um, looking forward to seeing you then. Um, see you guys. Um, I mean, really glad to have you tonight and uh, see you guys next time at QB Center. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. See you next time.